Good afternoon, everybody. It is so good to have you here with me on Live Safari in the middle of the African bush. We have started our afternoon with a challenge, it seems. There were some Nialas here, but they seem to be playing a great game of hide and seek and definitely winning at it. My name is Tess. I'll be taking you out on Rusty for the afternoon. Behind the camera today is Panda, and we've got the whole team ready to go. I'm going to try and move us a little bit forward, just so we can try and get a glimpse of those Nyanas. There's only two of them, a female and a young male, but they've been doing this the entire afternoon, and I understand why. Because this is the area where Cedric had lion tracks and leopard tracks this morning, so they're probably feeling a little bit nervous, naturally. So I would also be zigzagging if I was them. <clears throat> but thank you for joining us. If you have any questions for us, anything you'd like us to look for in particular, anything you're hoping we find, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Are you going to sit still, girly? Oh, she looks horribly nervous. But yes, we are live, we are interactive, and we cannot wait to hear what you have in mind for the afternoon. Oh, look how nervous she looks. This is brilliant. So what I'm wanting to follow up on this afternoon is the pride of lions that Cedric had tracks for and see if the leopard might still be around. Oh, she looks so nervous. I'm wondering if she can see or smell something we can't. That might be behind Rusty. Oh, look at her body language. It's not often you see a Nyala doing this. Oh, she's double guessing herself. Okay, we're gonna spend some time here and see if we can figure out, maybe she can see where the lions or the leopard are. For now, we'll send you over to Chris to say good afternoon on such a lovely day. Oh, love it when we get to start like that. And our plan was exactly just to Get to Ndlovu Dam, spend a bit of time here, Leopard Dam, spend a bit of time. Because it's now suddenly from this nice cool overcast morning, it's changed into a nice warm afternoon. And that means water holes. Look at this guy now. <laughs> See how he lifts up his foot and swing it. That's when they're thinking. And he's just thinking, okay, should I give them trouble or should I not? And he's obviously decided no. It's not going to give us trouble. He's, checking, he's keeping, keeping his eye on us, you know. He, uh... <laughs> anyway, I'm going to be quick. My name is Chris Owen Dell on Camera Ops. I'm going to get back to the elephant very quickly because he's going to drink there. Is just enjoying that water now on this nice warm afternoon. I won't say hot, I would say warm. And what a lovely start. Okay, so like I mentioned, our plan water roll to water roll and then once it's nice and cool we'll we'll just drive around and do our usual tactics of drive around and look for tracks and the nice thing is we can quickly hop out assess tracks even follow them a little bit at the same time look for some small things kind of like our signature here Christina is looking forward to all the Monday animal magic. Hi there, Christina. Lovely comment from Christina there. Looking forward to all the Monday animal magic. 
All of us are, definitely. Look at this start, so... Alright. Probably should give everybody a chance to show you what they've got. So let's go and look at what they've got. She's got some something magic but something small. Look at this starling. It's got a very tasty grub in its mouth. Ah, oh, of course. Off it goes. Oh, it's still there. Yay. Oh, and here's me. Hi, everyone. It's me, Trishala. I've got Morgan in camera. And uh, it's a wonderful sunny day, as you can see. So the colors of this glossy starling is just so perfect. Ah. <laughs> they were perfect. They were so, so lovely. Um, but nice and blue. That looked like a greater, greater blue-eared glossy starling. It can be a little bit more difficult um, to tell. And they don't have any obvious features and you've got to look really hard at their coloration. And of course, when they move so quickly, it doesn't give you much of a chance. But I love glossy starlings, uh, any of the variety, because they're so shiny. And actually, Chris was talking to you about this yesterday, um, about some of the colors in birds and how they're a result of, of um, structural col coloration, especially blues and shiny and iridescent colors. But anyway, speaking of Chris, let me send you over to him and Pridelands, and we're going to keep on moving. Boy is still having a drink. He's gonna make sure he fills that tummy up. This is one of those side things where we don't really want to discuss too much about elephant behavior and stuff. We've done plenty of that. Let's just enjoy it. Enjoy the scene and enjoy the elephant. Enjoy the visuals. A lot of people on safari, you know, even guides, I've seen a lot of that. And they want to bombard their viewers with a lot of knowledge. And there's also a time and place to just let the visuals speak, you know. Beverly wants to know how many liters of water could this elephant drink in one session. Now, Beverly, the average minimum they need in one day is about 90 liters. And the trunk of an adult elephant can hold roughly about 12 liters, 9 to 12 liters. So you can take... This is a slightly younger bull, so probably about five to seven liters in that trunk multiplied by about i would say easily they can easily do a 20 liter 20 to 30 liter in one session but they need a minimum of 90 odd liters a day that's the minimum they drink more than that most of the times.
can drink up to 220 litres easily a day. Splashing the body a little bit. Having a little bath. Hina D wants to know. Hello there. That is a natural spring that the elephant is drinking from. Right, Hina D and Lover Dam is a is a man made dam that we inherited, yeah. But the water supply is natural. It's rainwater that's captured by the dam wall. However, uh, quite recently, the ownership of Pridelands decided to supplement the water with a borehole and what you're seeing there is the inlet from where it's pumped with a solar powered borehole pump to supplement the water in the dry times because this dam actually dried up and the decision was made to supplement the water and that's why the water level suddenly a lot a lot higher it's not only with the rain and then just to make sure that there's adequate water provision, you know, for the animals. And typically of elephants, they prefer the cleanest water they can find. So that water coming out there from that inlet, so it's an underground pipe that comes from where the borel is, that's clean, clean, clean water. And obviously he has a preference for that. But from there it trickles down into the actual dam. He's thinking now. <laughs> to sit down around a fire in conversation is a practice as old as mankind. There is an ancient sense of magic about sharing and learning as embers twirl into the night sky. Here at Wild Earth, we see the value of this practice and want to retain it in an age where so much divides us. If you sign up to be an explorer, you can join in this gathering and return to the ritual of connection with Wild Earth.
this little lamb is an aggressive feeder. So they can be a little bit impatient sometimes. Any young herbivores that can be quite impatient trying to get milk. I think elephants, in fact, and rhinos are probably the gentlest. Impalas, buffaloes, all of those animals. Wow, that little one disappeared into the grass when it lay down. They, that motion of kind of moving the head backwards and forwards, bobbing it like that and being quite aggressive, encourages a little bit more milk flow. But you can imagine when it gets older, that might be a bit uncomfortable for mom. Oh, I love the little tail flicking. Ooh. Georgia, that's a bit of a difficult one for the lamb. If it does happen to get separated from the herd and loses the herd, it's going to be calling for its mom, and its mom should be calling and looking for it as well. But the problem with that is if you are calling as a little baby animal, the frequency of your voice is a little bit higher, and the animals, the predators in particular, know that frequency difference. Higher pitched means it's a smaller animal, and they will actively seek it out because then it's become an easy meal and it's giving away its location. So it will be calling, it will probably try and stumble around and smell for the herd because it does know its mom's smell and the smell of other impalas. But it's not yet experienced enough at this age to know where to go. Yay, the other mom is back. We're wondering. There's a little one in the grass. There we go. Hi, mom. You're back. But yes, they would have to try and look for them, hear them, smell them, call for them and hope that they manage to find them, and hopefully mom will be doing the same thing. That being said though, a separated impala lamb does not have a very high success rate. It, won't, it probably won't survive, purely because it is so vulnerable on its own. Whether it dies from dehydration or from predation, those are probably the two most likely scenarios to happen if it is separated. So nice to see that little lamb. It's happy now that it's had some milk. I wonder if it's going to come over and say hi to the other lamb again. Yes, where are we going? Group movement. Now already just in a few days you can see a size difference between those two lambs. One is a little bit younger than the other one because impala lambs grow so quickly. So the one that was suckling is now the one on the right is already quite a bit bigger than the one on the left that was lying down. They are so nervous. So did you see how as soon as the impala started to move in a slightly faster fashion immediate reaction from the lamb is to stick close to mom and run with mom Alibamba the reason that antelopes in particular would have a birthing season is because they need to try and time it together they are after all prey species particularly impalas try to give birth within about a week of each other usually maximum of maybe two weeks you might find one outlier that's you know, completely off by a month or two. Um, but they want to do that because if there are more of you together, there's a, a lower chance of getting eaten. So it's not as strict with things like predators. If predators lose a baby, they'll come straight back into estrus and have cubs again any time of the year. It doesn't matter. Cubs or pups, whatever it is. But if you've got something like an impala, even zebras have a bit of a birthing season. Giraffes usually do as well. Most of our herbivorous species, nyalas, bushbucks, they should all be giving birth now in the summer. So they kind of mass come into estrus and mass give birth within a week or two of each other. 
because they need to make sure that one, they're giving birth at a time where there's a lot of greenery, which there is because they're herbivorous, so they need plants to eat. They need water from the rainy season to produce milk, keep themselves going and get the lambs to start drinking milk as well. And then flood the predators with lots of little babies at the same time so there's more chance that they'll survive. If you had a herd of 50 impalas and only one gave birth and any predator came past, they would immediately go for the little one, not the big ones, because the little one is inexperienced, it's an easier target, it's lighter and it's an easier meal. If you've got 50 impalas with 50 lambs, there's a 1 in 50 chance that a lamb will get eaten compared to every other lamb and a 1 in 100 chance of getting eaten compared to every other impala because there's now 50 adults, 50 lambs. So they try and do everything at the same time so that they can at least um, have a less chance of getting eaten and a higher survival rate. If you did them one at a time you'd be in trouble. You guys look so nervous. You can see the male is almost moving them off now, saying, come on, move back to safety. So we have found the buffalo tracks here. Haven't found lion tracks on top of the buffalo tracks leaving the dam area. But maybe they're here. Oh, Zach, yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, there are circumstances that might cause a mom's milk to run dry. She might stop producing milk or may not even produce milk altogether. This can be from a variety of reasons, anything from dehydration to extreme disease or health issues. So if the immune is low and the, the body is deteriorating, there's not enough energy to produce milk. Oh, we've just been joined by some starlings. Um, and it could even happen from severe injury, anything like that. So I think the most common cause would be dehydration, but it absolutely can happen. There can also be a hormone imbalance that could stop a mom from producing milk. Impalas are alarming. <sighs> I don't know where... Can't see where they're looking. Oof. They're looking behind us, Panda. So normally, I am going to reposition us a little. Normally, when Impala's alarm call. If there is a predator close by, what happens is, especially for leopards, the leopards will come out and show themselves. They come out, you know, they kind of curve their tail upwards, make it known that they know they've been seen. So I just want to have a quick look here. That impala was looking kind of behind us here, but I'm not seeing anything. I'm just going to stop for a minute and just listen again and watch for movement. Leopards like to show themselves when they've been spotted. Lions just go back to sleep. They don't really tend to mind too much, especially if it's in parlors. So everyone is already on edge, right? Because the smell of the leopard and the smell of the lions is still around from this morning. So they are naturally going to be alarming at things that maybe aren't predators, but they're just alarming at movement. But it's still super important for us to check because we know the lions would have come down following the buffaloes and had a nap because it got hot. They might still be here. The leopard may have already gotten something and be in a tree or under a bush or it may have just moved through. But it might be here. Oh, those impalas are still looking this way. I'm just going to move us forward again. So I know it seems like I'm doing a bit of up and down, but as I'm watching the impalas, I'm watching where they're looking, and they're looking in here, just on our left. I didn't even realize there were two males with those impalas. And we're just going to have a quick look here in case there is a leopard or something lying around.
Wild Earth Explorers, this one's for you. You stand a chance to head off to the wondrous Camp Fig Tree Mountain Safari Lodge, situated on the border of Addo Elephant National Park, for an unforgettable three nights stay for two. Witness the incredible elephant herds at Addo firsthand and explore with an open vehicle safari tailored to you or a relaxing bush picnic. Sign up to be an explorer to treat yourself to a much needed. We are wondering, putting ourselves in the paws of the lions, where would we go if we were them? Now it's a pretty big block between Mvuba Road and Firebreak and Pafusa Cut Line. If I was them and the buffaloes came down and we knew or thought the buffaloes would turn around and go back, it would be a good idea to wait in the block somewhere here probably close to the drainage line. So the buffaloes come down, and as they turn to come back, they're walking towards you. So I think they're in this block, where those impalas were looking maybe a little bit further in. But we are just having a quick look close to Gowrie Dam anyway, in case they have moved this way. But because the buffaloes have turned, maybe they're already turning them as well and, and following. I don't know, maybe the impalas are just on edge. But if I was the lions, I would have laid down in the shade next to that drainage line and just waited. Because then as the buffalo come past the drainage line, you're low down and hidden. The drainage line pulls your smell away. Logically, it would make sense. And it's nice and cool. But I think what we are going to do is quickly check Gauri Dam and then actually do a circuit. Keep doing Central Road, Gauri Cutline, Biffleson Cutline back down in Vubu Road because we came from Gallagher Pan so we didn't check the rest of in Vubu Road. Can you smell that panda? Spice, good question. Let's have a listen. We could hear guinea fowls alarming. We could hear woodland kingfisher alarming and we could hear rattling cysticulars. I did not hear anything else, but let's have a listen.
I'm not hearing any alarm calling at the moment. I take it back, I've just heard a woodland kingfisher alarming. But nobody else is alarming. So I suppose the main birds that we would listen for that are alarming, guinea fowls are a really good indicator, especially if they're up in the trees, then you know there's probably a leopard around. Rattling cysticlers alarm at a lot of things, but it's always worthwhile listening to and checking. Franklins and spur fowls as well, if they are going berserk, then it's a good idea to have a look. Woodland kingfishers, starlings. Oh, I've actually just spotted a beautiful starling near Panda. Can you see it? It looks like a Cape Glossy starling. It's not a Birchall starling. Either Cape Glossy or Greater Blue Eared. Cape Glossy. Doesn't have those big blue ear coverts. But the bright orangey yellow eye was the indicator there. Bye, starling. <laughs> So just to explain to you what we smelled and why we stopped, and then Spuss asked a really interesting question, so we stopped to listen. But the reason we reversed is because Panda and I both immediately smelled, at the same time, scat. Strong smell of scat. And I haven't seen us drive over any, so I just wanted to check the junction. Wow, Rusty, you are making some noises today. I wanted to check the junction. I'm just rolling forwards for now. See if there's any lion tracks here. There is a spur file alarming in the drainage now. I don't see any lion tracks. Can you hear them? So there's somebody alarming in the drainage line. <laughs> God, that's such an interesting question. The most recognizable scat smell. Probably lions after a particularly big meal. Because, <laughs> especially if it's still fresh, if it's warm, it hits you in the face, that smell. It hits you. It's um, quite exciting. Quite something. Yeah, I think lions. Although, any predators, because it's red meat, any predators get smells. If you miss that smell, then you might have to have your nose checked. Which, I mean, some people do. I know some people that can't smell it. But they do also know that they can't smell very well. They do have issues with their nose. But it's... On a hot day, when a lion gets up and goes to the bathroom, you've got to hope, cross your fingers, plait your hair, cross your toes, hold every lucky charm you have, you've got to hope you're not downwind. <laughs> it is occasionally enough to make you cry. So, <laughs> rather avoid being downwind if you can, especially if it's a pride of lions. Sure. It can be a bit much. Hmm, I'm not noticing any, there's no tracks through here, I think they stopped, because I think they would have known the buffaloes came down and would have turned back, so I think they stopped before even the drainage line that goes to the dam. And there's no leopard tracks here either, so I wonder if the leopard is still around Gallego Pan somewhere, maybe Kalamba. I think we need to do a loop and see. We're just keeping it really slow for now, purely because we know we're in a hot spot. We know that this is the last place there was any sign of the predators this morning. 
So that's good for us to check and see. I feel like the search is going to be intensive this afternoon. However, lots of birds, lots of other things. So I think it's going to be very good either way. For now though, Chris is also searching. It's not just me. So let's go see what he is searching for. I'm, um... I've got no real target you know uh, I'm, I'm just thinking we had such a oh, sun such an eventful weekend lots of things happening lions and all sorts of things I'm literally I'm just I'm just cruising around now enjoying the bush and join me I mean it's it's fantastic um, just uh, checking some things out okay I'm gonna go to leopard dam so there is somewhat of a plan in this beautiful Nofon tree. And as I go along, I just think about, okay, this, okay, that, you know, there's a lot of things that goes through my head. I'm just thinking that we should work around Leopard Dam for a bit. Yeah, there's some indications of buffalo tracks there this morning. There were lion tracks, but I think those lions, they've uh, I think Raynaud actually followed the tracks and it crossed into Dijoni. One thing that I'm, and you can actually see it here, so while we're here, let's just discuss that before we get to Leopard Dam, is in a week, the grass went from bright green back to its almost dormant dry stage. Even the burnt areas, which we'll go through now, you can actually see withering. There's some green patches and that's because we haven't had follow-up rain. And you hear me talk about rain a lot. But one big rainstorm, the stuff is green again. Or at least new green leaves will come out. Isn't that incredible how the bush responds to this type of stimulus? Whether it is rain and then suddenly lack of rain. Okay, I'll need to start preserving some resources here. Okay, channel stuff back to the roots. The rain's not coming anymore. I'm not saying they think like us, but I'm, I'm talking as if the plant could think. Anyway, just something, that's what I meant by saying when I drive around, there's all sorts of things that goes through my head. Even when I drive on the highway, you know, if I'm on holiday, I'll, I'll be driving over the mountains and I'll think, oh, look at that lichen there. Goodness, uh, oh, this is beautiful this time of the year, all the... The mountain kirkias are, are bright red and ah, that's fantastic. So it's, it's almost subconscious as I drive around. I thought, like, oh, that North Farm's been pushed off. There's a, it's just constant thinking about nature. Actually, my wife sometimes laughs at me when we drive because I'll, I'll talk to myself about these things and then like oh yeah oh, that's pretty cool she's like what and i'm just thinking about that particular bird that was there you know just like oh, don't you ever stop <laughs> anyway so yeah well my wife's also a good old naturalist Elaine wants to know if the Leopard Dam get its name because it's a leopard hotspot. Elaine, I'm not certain to be honest with you. There's so many things about Pridelands I've not actually even asked yet. I promise you I'm going to find out from Anton and I will let you know. How about that? Just to make a note here, Elaine. Anton's probably watching the show now, so he'll probably send me a a brief just now where Leopard Dam has got its name from. I'm not going to even guess. I'm going to get you the right info. And I will get back to you. 
Often with reserves, these names have got to do with something. Triaz Dam and Juma. Self-explanatory. Um, sometimes there might have been a particular sighting. A, you know, uh, elephant carcass, for instance, in Juma. Uh, like here, Tamboti Donga. It runs along the Tamboti Donga. Um, for instance, uh, what other roads can we look at? Uh, no, Jajani Cutline. It's the cutline between Pridelands and Jajani. Um, so these names often have a, well, most of the time have a, a, a significant meaning. Well, I'm going to find out for you, Elaine. Just now. Keep watching. Keep watching. The answer is coming. We are now looking at some zebra. One's also looking at us. We are hoping that they'll give us some indication of where we could find these lions that we're looking for. They're not completely relaxed, but it makes sense because as you can see, it's very windy. And that doesn't really bode well for them. It makes it a little bit more difficult to hear or smell predators. And this at least two of them that have some pretty young foals with them so they're going to be quite protective and a little extra vigilant they haven't moved much since we've been here and they've been kind of staring in a similar direction so we might try and move down there and have a look in a bit <laughs> look at these two here's one of those foals we were talking about that's it trying to get a bit of um a scratch <laughs> just getting bumped out of the way by its mother You know exactly how to scratch uh, it looks quite simple but it's probably a, a, a significant thing for them to to learn because like the youngster was doing it couldn't really get the spot it wanted to scratch or wanted to scratch with its hoof it kind of just flails and thrusts it in the intended direction but it doesn't have the kind of precision <laughs> that um, the mother should be displaying. It was a little bit uh, uncoordinated at that that particular scratch. But the, the youngster will have to try and almost learn from the mother, watch it, see how it picks up its hooves, and then with more practice, be able to get the exact spots that it needs to, to scratch any parasites off of it. Oh, look at this. This is a bit of a tender moment. <laughs> so sweet. Hi Angela, you'd like to know if it's possible for a zebra not to grow a mane? It's, I mean it is possible, but um, it's possible because if the genes are present for it to grow a mane, then something could happen to those genes and make them not grow a mane. But that being said, I've never seen that myself and I've never 
come across it, but I've also not ever looked for it. So there might be some information out there regarding whether they could, or whether there are any instances of zebras not having a mane. I will have to have a look, but I can't recall anything like that previously. Genes are sometimes linked in in ways that don't immediately make sense. So, for example, um, the genes responsible for the growth of the mane might be the genes that are responsible for the growth of fur all over the body. And so if there was a problem with that gene, maybe it would mean that the zebra wouldn't have any fur at all, in which case we would say that it's a gene that would, uh, it w it's a mutation that would cause death or it would not allow the animal to survive. Um, in which case those animals would likely die uh, or be aborted as fetuses. So we might not even know. Um, but it is possible simply because a mane exists, so the, the opportunity for a mane not to exist must also be, be a possibility. But that's a really interesting question. I'd love to do some more research on that. Now this is quite interesting because this zebra, its front legs don't really have any obvious stripes. Now if you compare its front legs to the front leg of the foal that's next to it, you can see that there's quite a difference. Now as zebras get older, those, those stripes on, on the legs do fade a little bit, but I must say that's, like, that's quite, quite obvious. Again, it comes down to the movement of those, of those cells that carry melanin that I was chatting to you about. And whether there's some disruption in that movement Things like that, again, linked to the genetics. Oh, look at that. When you can't get that itch on the face with your hoof, why not just try your mother's neck? She's really staring us down. Oh, nope, you're not getting any milk, little one. <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. Bark, you'd like to know what a zebra's closest relative in the bush is? Well, I mean, obviously their other zebras would be their closest relatives. So um, a plain zebra and a mountain zebra would be closely related or more closely related than anything else, but also their um, odd-toed ungulates. They've only got one, uh, one toe. Compared to the majority of other ungulates, which are even-toed ungulates. So even though, I mean, theoretically, they would be more closely related to the odd-toed ungulates than the even-toed ones. It is so, so, there's such a gap between them that I would not be able to say that they're close, more closely related to them than others. So, in the bush, zebras, just other zebras, really. Again, not something I thought of. I haven't thought about that in a while. I usually like to to think about the relationships between animals. They're giving us quite a look and we're actually very far from them. So I do think that their 
smelling something in the air. Hopefully, it'll help us find our lions. You can see lots of tails swatting away flying insects. Lots of scratching. You'll often see that with a herd. In fact, not just a herd, even um, with groups of humans. If you see one person you know, scratching themselves, then suddenly you feel a little bit itchy or maybe you're watching something and there's something crawling on the person on the screen and then you start to get a little bit itchy. It's a really important um, kind of mechanism or this automatic response because uh, if you can catch a parasite before you realize that it's, that it's on your body, then the better. So if you see someone else itching, perhaps it indicates to you or to another zebra that oh, something is around, let me start scratching now. The updated Wild Earth app is here, as well as 12 hours of fresh live content a day for free. You can watch repeats and highlights of shows you have missed, and if you have subscribed to be an explorer, exclusive access to the behind the scenes channel, access to rehearsals for new locations, a chance to give us feedback, and explorers also watch totally ad free. Download the app today. Waiting here at Leopard Dam, and while we're waiting, we saw this very interesting structure. Now, it's that well known nest of the buffalo weavers on the dead tree towards the inlet of the dam. And just below it, you will see where's my stick? I'm going to walk forward a bit. I can point it if you want to. Below it, you can see an old piece of or of the uh, buffalo weaver's nest but there's some white stuff on there and it looks like it's been flattened and one thing we've seen the Egyptian geese perched there a few times right so this is interesting behavior because Egyptian geese are mainly ground nesters but they're not exclusively ground nesters they will make an excavation in the ground where they'll nest but they'll nest we've seen so many places under bushes uh, and
Ya está. If you are having a Monday or, or Monday of the blue kind, well, it's now it's time to forget about everything. Join us here in Medikwe, where we are looking at a young male line right here in the thickets. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin with BK behind the camera. We were saying early on that we're having cat withdrawal symptoms and that is characterized by a roaring sensation in the ear and seeing spots in front of your eyes. And we decided to do something about that this afternoon. He just mobile. Twos normally. move soon. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit jealous of Kevin's line. <laughs> Lions on the move in the daytime. How lucky. How lucky. Okay, we are now officially completing the circuit. You came to us just at the right time. Just in front of me here is the last place Cedric had tracks, the junction of Mvubu Road and Gotta Go Shortcut. And from here. We don't know which way the lions went. Buffalo tracks come in, go out. Lion tracks come in, don't go out. Hmm. So I think what we are going to do, since we have checked around Gauri Katla and Bifosu Katla, and we've checked that part of the fire break, the tracks did not go east. I think what we're going to do is go back towards Gallagher Pan and check Gallagher Shortcut back up to the boundary in case they went that way. That being said, they could be lying right here, 20 meters off the road, laughing at me right now. I wouldn't be surprised. Would not be the first time, folks. Would not be the first time. But I will tell you that every set of impalas we've seen so far has looked nervous. The Nialis went the birds have been alarm calling. I'm hoping we come around the corner and there's just lions, there's a tail flicking, you know. But it is scorchingly hot as well, so that does mean that animals are kind of sticking to the shade, even the herbivores. We've only seen, I think, three groups of impala. The other two groups, we saw that first group, the other two groups is one female, one female in the thickets. And then that herd of Nialas. If I was a lion in this pride of lions, we don't know which pride it is. But if I was a lion, I would be here. In the straight edge line, just this little patch of shade we're in now, you can feel the difference immediately from hot to nice and cool. The straight edge line is the best place to be. And I 
had a brief little look in the drainage line earlier, but haven't been back in. But maybe it's worth trying that. Maybe let me go into Gotta Go Shortcut and come back and then take a quick walk into the drainage line. See if we can find where those lines are. Hiding spots, so many. Ah, where do you begin? Okay, wish me luck, everybody. It looks like I'm gonna need it. The lines are one upping me for now. Chris is still at the water hole, so let's go have a look what's happening there. All right, we're back, and I was actually telling you about the nesting behavior of the Egyptian geese now. There's a couple of things here. We've seen the geese there. They nest in a whole bunch of different areas. Like I mentioned, I've even seen them on sociable weaver nests in the Kalahari. Uh, they've even been known to use all sorts of structures, shipwrecks, it's been recorded. I've even heard of a case where they shared a nest with a knobbill duck. So normally on the ground, but they will do it anywhere. But one thing that is very interesting is, is that the lining of the nest, the top part there, that white fluff that you see there, they're almost exclusively the lining of the nest, not the material that the nest is built with. The lining of the nest, that white fluff that you see there is down. I'm sure everybody knows what down is. Now, down is essentially the fine, fine feathers underneath the top or exposed feather. They found underneath the tougher, how can I say, exterior feathers. And that's, if you look at young birds, think about the wigs back at Juma, that fluffy feather. So if chicks are often mainly covered in down, and then later the, the mature feathers are, oh, some, a surprise coming in while we're looking. But anyway, that is telltale of the Egyptian geese and how they also use the existing structure of an unused portion of the sociable weaver's nest. Clever, very clever. And I've got a surprise walking into shot now. Hello, boys. <laughs> okay, so our water hole plan has paid off. Just gonna let Reynard know he's desperately looking for buffalo. Station says two Dugger boys at Leopard Dam. Yeah, no problem, make your way. I'll show him Reynard's one of the operators here and he's desperately looking for buffalo. Okay, I think we should probably reposition a bit, hey, Ready? You got a good shot. Odie says he's good. Interesting shot. <laughs> so let's put this radio off. These voices in my head. <sighs> you still good there. All right, let's just get a little bit further back and we'll get a better view on these buffaloes. It'll literally be like a couple of seconds. 
Maybe turn. Ah, I can't really see. <sighs> A lot of comments. Plan and patience. The perfect combo. I wonder if we shouldn't go forward, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. OD is in agreement. You know, that's what one thing I do enjoy about working with different cam ops. Each and every one has their own unique character. And I work a lot with Odie, obviously. And uh, it's just we kind of like get each other, you know. I'm going to go in here a little bit. I'm sure we can clear a little bit. Oh, there we go. Ah. There we go. Sorry about all the maneuvers there. People just wanted to get you the best view of these buffalo. Hot day, water holes. I just want to. These buffaloes now. I've got something I need to show you about these buffalo. Odie, keep it on there. My stick has just fallen. I just want to grab something quickly. Just keep it on that buffalo. Sorry, there was literally something next to me that I had to pick up, which we'll show you just now. We'll show you just now what we got here. I'll quickly show you some what it is going to fly away. Remember what we just spoke about with the Egyptian geese. And the down feathers, the down, it's called down. Look at this. I'm gonna have to keep it all the way. And this is blown from that nest. And I just saw it, yeah. And you can see it's those very tiny feathers, and they're underneath, close to the skin. And these are the ones that insulates the bird and creates a bit of volume. And then on top of them, the smooth feathers creates the airfoil. Now for those of you who are familiar with aviation know that in order to sustain flight you need an airfoil which is the surface of the plane. It needs to be smooth so therefore the feathers are flattened and smooth. This will cause drag if it was an outside and the air will just go through it. It won't create an airfoil. This is to insulate the bird and to help buff them up if they need to. And this is what the geese used. Lovely. Ah, oh, very cool. I can even smell them. It smells like a chicken. This is phenomenal stuff. Talking about Ooh, look at him. If you've ever wondered what a friendly buffalo face looks like, that's about as close as you'll get. Hmm. Suzanne says it's perfect on a hot day. I tell you, I wouldn't mind to wallow with that buffalo, but that won't be a very clever thing to do. Right, I actually have a 
something to report. Let's just watch this guy. That is a decent sized buffalo, that. About the origins of Leopard Dam, the name. All right, I've spoken to Anton, and when they took over the ownership of Pridelands, uh, remember this was semi agricultural land. There was some game farming that happened here and all sorts of other things. And um, under the current owners, sort of Tudorich, this was eventually incorporated back into the greater Balule, essentially Kruger. And game, the big game was scarce at the time. And the first leopard sighting recorded was here, apparently a big male, and he was very relaxed. And he stuck around here for quite some time. And this became the hotspot for leopards initially. In fact, this male had a neck to reveal itself at funny moments. Uh, even so much so that the owners had a, a quick social event here with a well-known rugby player we can't mention. And... Um, they were standing here chatting and stuff, and then the leopard literally, after minutes, walked right past them. Uh, anyway, so that just emphasized the name Leopard Dam, and subsequently it became a hot spot for leopards. I mean, Pixie Pan has been seen here a number of times, and sort of this is like the central point of her territory. But the name originated from the fact that the very first leopard under ownership of Pridelands, once Pridelands was established as Pridelands, the very first leopard was seen here. And it's almost like a, how can I put it, a, like a symbol of, 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 of what Pridelands stands for. It's a stand for biodiversity protection. And seeing that one leopard subsequently more just showed us we we're on the right path Like I said, if you've ever seen a somewhat happy buffalo face, that's the one lying in the water. And still they look grumpy. Look at this fellow here. He's got that typical debt collector face. And don't get close to these guys on foot. They will not like it at all. But I do like them a lot. I love the attitude. Don't mess with me. Leave me alone or bear the consequences. Fantastic. Well, what an incredible C 
sequence of events here. Talking about the goose, feathers, the nesting, having the buffalo surprise us, spending time checking them out while they were rolling in the mud. That was very entertaining. And now they're relaxing. You are back with us in Madikwe. Now only this morning me and Biko were saying that we were having cat withdrawal symptoms. Now that is normally characterized by uh, constant roaring in the ear and spots in front of your eyes and we decided this afternoon we're going to do something about it and so far so good. We found this young male here at Fudu Fudu Pan in the northern section of Madikwe. He's here on his own. Normally walked with his very elderly mum. And he has been contact calling. And I'm sure he's going to do it again. Let's just be patient. That is, of course, if we're going to hear him over this rattling cesticula in the tree above us, calling away. This youngster just over the two years old, you can see that the mane starting to form nicely now. I think he uses shampoo and conditioner and he blow dries it in the morning. Yeah, stunning. It's very soft looking mane, isn't it? And because he's a young guy, there's no scarring to the face yet. And we're going to stick with him for a while and we'll see what he gets up to. There's water close by. I mentioned the pan earlier on. I'm sure he'll be thirsty and he'll head over there. That will make fantastic viewing. So we are planning to spend just a little bit of time with him. Flies has been bothering, bothering him the whole time. While we patiently wait, we're going to head back to Chris in the meantime with his wallowing buffer. This guy is now having a a total, total, total bath. There's the dugger boy. That's where the name come from. He's covered, covered in mud. Dugger is mud or cement, actually. So in the construction industry in South Africa, a lot of the people use dugger as well as, as, as cement. And that looks like wet cement that's on him. He's dugger boy. <laughs> the attitude. There's not an inch of him that's not covered in mud. Everything. Even his belly, his genitals. I think it's literally his eyes. Ooh. And that cools him down. But at the same instance, it also helps to get him get rid of ticks, fleas, external parasites. It helps to cover winds. Oh, look at him. That's 
It's about as exciting as a buffalo sighting can get. Guy is having so much fun. And remember, there's a lot of things itching on that skin as well. Oh, that is so lucky. So nice. That's definitely the happiest buffalo I've seen in my life. Because they are grumpy things. And they're both two very old boys. The other one is approaching our car here in a semi-friendly manner. I just love how this afternoon unfolded. I mentioned earlier we're going to go to Leopard Dam. We know there were buffalo tracks. It would be nice to see buffalo bang. Here they surprise us while, again, looking at the smaller things. And that's why I urge everyone, when you're on safari, take time. Do not ignore the smaller things. Many times in my career I stopped to look at small things or tracks or flowers or birds. And I was surprised by high profile game. Or what has been perceived as high profile game. For me, a goose nest is as exciting as a leopard. As a naturalist, I pretty much like everything. Except flies and mosquitoes. I don't like them at all. Brad wants to know, where do the animals wallow in the dry season? It is a very good question. Um, if the water totally disappears, it can present a problem. Elephants, we know, will move huge distances in order to find um, wallows. Buffalo, to a certain degree. Things like warthogs are going to struggle. They don't move long distances. Um, it's probably not going to cause mortalities, but it will it will result in a very high parasite load. Um, the condition will go down because they'll have to spend a lot more time in shade in order to cool themselves down because they don't have access to mud and those things, water to cool themselves down. But it will usually be in extreme droughts, not your normal dry season. Even in your normal dry season, most of the areas here, there is some wallow. That retains water somewhere most of the time. But there have been droughts where <laughs> expansive areas in the crater Kruger was void of water. Or mud even for that matter. But remember it's a natural occurrence. Droughts is a disruptive event that forms part of the animal or a lot of these species is limiting factors. It's necessary to occasionally have droughts. Dark meme.
Aside from the dark mane that gave him his name, he can be recognized by a distinctive limp. This limp stems from an injury to his right leg he sustained while taking down a buffalo with the Inkohuma pride. Yes, sitting at Twin Dams, just a listening out here. I've got two Egyptian geese that's wandering around here at the inflow of uh, Twin Dams. And I'm hoping that we are going to find something quite interesting this side. I did have some leopard tracks around Trias Dam, but unfortunately so far, no luck. But good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric Dold, and behind the camera here on Rooster this afternoon, we've got Muscles Mpo. So yes, thank you for joining us once again. Hoping everybody's having a good safari this afternoon. And uh, I am just, as I said, I'm just sitting here and looking out at Twin Dams just to listen out. There is quite a bit of uh, ox peckers that's busy calling yeah, in towards the Molawati side. So that's definitely an indicator of maybe something like uh, Impala or Kudu, um, something like that, maybe even Niala as well. So I'm just uh, waiting, maybe we are lucky seeing them coming over the dam wall. But yes, as I was saying, there was female leopard tracks around Treehouse Dam. It was heading up like in a northwesterly direction up Treehouse Dam Road towards Philemon's cut line and uh, it looked like it crossed over maybe for Shudulu because then we followed up all the way towards uh, Vuyatilla Axis and then looks like it went west along Vuyatilla Axis oh well, there's a lot of fox beckers around there I just want to listen out maybe we're lucky maybe buffalo or something apparently I heard that uh, Tess said that the buffalo that uh, we spotted this morning they have gone north into Biffle's Hook. Maybe she's lucky with those lions. I think she said that she's got some lion tracks that's on top of my vehicle tracks from this morning. So it looks like those lions are maybe doing circles around us. I'm just taking a look at those Egyptian geese. Absolutely love them. Always, I think every single bottle hole will have a pair of Egyptian geese. Of course, quite territorial, quite vicious as well over the area. If any other Egyptian geese come flying past here, you'll find that this male and female will go quite crazy. All right, well, let's go over to Kevin to see what's happening at Madikwe. <laughs> And there we go, right in time, you guys. Just 
joined us, joined us in the nick of time. Fantastic to hear the lions roaring. He did his first, first roar about seven, eight minutes ago, and that's on average the time interval between roars when they get started up for their nightly activities. Now you could hear that very deep, you could hear that very deep booming noise. Now your big cats like lion, tiger, leopard, they are classed big cats not because of the size of them, but because of the arrangement of the voice box or the larynx. Now the voice box is not fused in the windpipe actually suspended on two on, on cartridges so it's uh, it is actually movable um, and when that air gets pushed through from the lungs it gets pushed past the voice box or we call it a oh nice we call it a suspensorium because it is suspended in the windpipe and that causes it to move up and down to bounce now can you picture a a speaker of a radio or a stereo, you know, when it's f going full volume, you get that bouncy effect that you can see. It's exactly the same thing. And that creates that very deep, booming sound called a suspensorium, suspended wind box. Or voice box, shall I say, larynx. This is actually the first time I've heard this young boy roar. He is on the fringe of the two big territorial males. Let's hope these, those two big There is a different line here on the turn. <laughs> okay, I think we may have temporarily lost somebody, but don't panic. We have found a new adventure on this side. I discovered an old two track that I think goes to a hyena den off of Mbuga Road. We followed up on some alarm calling and it's officially my new favorite spot on Juma, hands down. I'm in between the drainage lines, those steep ones at Gallagher Pan. We found lion tracks, we found leopard tracks and all roads lead to here. All of them. Ah, it was Kevin we lost, I see. Don't worry, we know where he is, we will find him. So Gallagher Pan is kind of just behind us. We had a very upset impala. We had some very upset birds. I don't think the lines are in the drainage line. I really do. We are so close, I can feel it. We just need to pinpoint exactly where we are. Unfortunately, that section where it goes into the drainage line has washed away, so I can't get rusty through there. But we've got a decent look into this section of the drainage line. We just need to try and get around to the other side now. See if we can get a view from that side. We're on the northern side now. Now I was wondering, maybe you, you all could tell me if this is the same den. It does look like a hyena den, let me tell you, because there are skulls and bones lying around and there's a whole entrance we're gonna show you what it looks like because this is fascinating i didn't know where it was i think i'm happy now that we found it is this not a beautiful den site so there's bones here on the floor and then of course an entrance on the side of that termite mound and a very clear track so i'm imagining this is an old hyena den 
is gorgeous panda bear remember i was telling you what i found on the car yesterday let me see if i can get that one <laughs> i've just found a tick on the car again yes there it is it looks like a bond tick or a rhino tick i don't know if we'll be able to get it but there it goes there's a tick don't go that way we're trying to see you <sighs> ah, look at that moving quite fast looking very red it is a very big tick Jarrett is saying in my ear this thing is massive it is one of the biggest that I've seen not the safest option but comparing it to the size of my family very big and now in the shade now it looks like it might be a form of bond tick I don't think it'll climb up the feather. No, don't come closer to me, thank you. You can go the other way. <laughs> it's got these little red spots on its back. This, of course, is looking for an insect to attach itself to to start eating blood. Can we put you on that end of the feather while you climb up there? No, not interested in birds. It has to be living. So they're actually attracted to carbon dioxide as well. Oh, I can't see you. There we go. Oh, back in the middle. Look at that. No, don't fall. Don't fall into my car. <laughs> you are going to be going back into the bush, little one. Not staying on Rusty. There you can see those markings. So you can see it walks a little bit like a spider. So they have eight legs. They're more closely related to arachnids than anyone else. Standing by. Afternoon, no major updates. Those in Gala and Konsa are still coming towards Galago Pan. No other updates. Lola, thank you. It it takes getting used to, let me tell you, but I'm sorry that your skin is crawling. I think because I know that I can kind of move it around a little bit with the feather, that makes me feel ah a smidge better until it starts walking directly towards me. <laughs> I'm not sure how many stations are on Juma. I heard Dylan from Chitwa and I heard Peter on here earlier, but I don't know if they crossed on. Okay, you are making this very difficult because you're being very active. So you are going back in the bush, no. <laughs> okay, so at least you can hear the panic in my voice, right? <laughs> so this little one is moving super fast. I'm going to safely put you back. There we go. Back onto the ground. Bye-bye. There it goes. Happy adventure. <laughs> Ticks can be quite unpleasant, but they're just doing what they do, you know, we've all got to subsist on something, and for them it's blood. And in fact that's quite nutritious, full of good vitamins, amino acids, iron, some really cool things to keep you going and it's in a nice neat little parcel bit of moisture in there too so for a lot of birds like oxpeckers that's a good nutrient package shall we say anyway do forgive me I know that it might be a little bit bumpy and a little bit noisy but we have to keep on moving because these lions are around here somewhere and I really do want to find them Sorry, my um, vehicle sometimes has power steering and other times not. So these sharp turns are a little bit difficult for me. So you're just going to have to stay with me while I look like a very weak driver. It's starting to cool down. 
uh, which is good. The air has been cool for a while, but the sun is starting to get a little bit softer. And if they are where we think we are, uh, where we think they are, this is going to bode bode well to see some action. So I'm hoping that we get some of that action. I've had such a chill time at Amakala so far. I mean, it's only day four. Feels like it's been a while. Um, full of like really nice, cool, small things. The Jacko Pops has been amazing. So I think I would enjoy a bit of action. So we have a strong feeling about down there. Let's go. That beautiful uh, uh, virtual starling that is just uh, busy looking for some little you know, insects around you on the ground. And just around the one of the magic quarry bush, uh, not too far off uh, Chilapan. I just went behind that bush now. Come on, you can come out for us. The sun is hitting it just right, so it's actually quite nice just taking a look at the coloration. But now he has just oh, yeah, he's coming now. He's going to come very soon. Beautiful, I love it. Love those. Uh, the descent quality colors that comes through and it's, it gives it beautiful shimmering colors and uh, it's I love it and especially it all comes through with the pigmentation with the melanin so the melanin which actually produces either the black or the dark brown feathers and if uh, the sun just hits it just right it actually gives it a shimmering color of the virtual starling I love it. I'm just watching it going past in now. And sometimes we actually take uh, take them for granted because uh, there's so many of them around. I got them, of course, in the Cape Glossy Starling. We got the Greater Blue Eared Starling, and uh, you know, and almost got that same kind of sh shimmering colour that comes off their feathers. And sometimes we just see so many of them that we just you know bypass them instead of really actually sitting there and just enjoying it especially with a sunny day like this where the sun is hitting it just perfect and you've got that beautiful gold sun that's coming through it actually make like it almost enhances that green greenish color on their feathers Paloma, um, I've seen them actually going for snakes. I've seen them going for, um, I've seen it at lodges before, not once, so several times when there's like a, say, a spotted bush snake or something that's uh, at the lodge. Um, I've seen actually starlings go for it, but they won't. They'll just try and maybe more kind of, um, you know, chase it away than actually, um, actually going for it to eat it because they won't really eat it. So it's more chasing them away. Um, but they always uh, kind of uh, mob those uh, snakes. So it's not just one starling. You'll get like the, the virtual starling. You'll get the Cape Glossy starling. Um, you'll get all different kind of starlings there together and um, actually acting as like a, a, like a unit uh, to try and chase the snake away. But they won't eat the snake. I haven't seen them eating a snake. They're more like going for things like insects. Of course, like little grasshoppers. Or beetles. Absolutely, where's he gone now? Oh, there, I saw there, yeah. sorry. I just thought he went away there. But the Cape Glossy Starling is just smaller compared to your virtual sort of Starling or Cape Glossy Starling, a little bit smaller. Hasn't got that long tail and they've got that beautiful, like, uh, yellowish uh, eye where the virtual Starling's got very much a black eye. Oh, there you go. I just caught something. Of course, many times, even the flying flying ants, if they are out in numbers, you'll find that these starlings are loving it there. Oh, there it goes. Bye bye. No, he doesn't want to hang around anymore. He's got like a, a crested Franklin that's alarm calling at the background. All right, while well, we're going to continue, let's head over to Tess to see if she's got a tick to show you.
I'm literally going loopy, tracking lines. Any loops. I feel like I can only drive in one direction now, just in circles. <laughs> okay, we have come full circle once again. We are on Mvubu Road, gotta go shortcut, I mean Gallagher Pan. I'm quickly checking this drainage line. We're gonna go and check Gowrie Dam and then come up the other side towards quarantine. Just to have a look because I don't know where these lines teleported to but they've got some crazy good skills. <laughs> they're somewhere, they're just sleeping. They're flat sleeping. Avoiding us. And this is exactly why we say if animals do not want to be seen, they won't be. They're having a nice relaxing day. <laughs> So I will take the hint, I'm going to check the dam, check up to quarantine and then go on another adventure. Standing by. Yeah, I'm sorry to worry, I was just checking, has any of the missing guy or did you? Uh, negative, the only active missing guy is the one on Little Gari, just south of Gari Main, east of Weaver's Nest Junction. Okay, good night. Yeah, okay, so I want to cross over to Juma House. Or maybe one month or something. I think there might be a fishy walk, so we're going to go and see if we can find it on Gary Dam Wall. But Kevin has found his lines again. Well done, Kevin. Okay, it's still rather hot. I've got a funny feeling I need to go back to Nvlovo Dam again. I don't know why. Sort of hop between the dams. But I think if we go to Nvlovo Dam now, stay there for a the little bit, like a 10, 15 minute thing, see what comes up. And then from there, it will be cool enough and then we'll start branching out and kind of like work the area. I want to eventually sort of like towards sunset work the area in the south some very fresh leopard tracks on our entry road heading that way so it's too early I want to be there around sunset and work that area but very likely one of Pixie Pan's older daughters so yeah we're about 10 minutes away from Nklovu Dam. So an update on those lines from last night. The tracks went all the way up to Jijani, so they're not around. All right, we are, like I said, off to Nklovu Dam. So while we do that, let's head over to Cedric to see what he's got. Yes, yeah, so I'm sitting here with a beautiful male giraffe, absolutely a stunning specimen of a giraffe. Very tall, full grown, good five and a half meters this male. I don't go hide behind the bush now. Maybe he might go to the for a drinky. Ooh, he'll be nice. Okay, I think he's gonna go around that side. Let's go. Mm, yeah, I think go around a bit so because he's not gonna come out there. He's gonna, it's a pathway, it's an animal pathway that's just heading straight towards it. There's another pan at the back end there. I think he wants to go there. I might just stop there and see if we can get a better view of him. Sorry, because he's not gonna, he's not gonna come in the open from where he is now. Oh, he might actually. Sorry, sorry, poor my bad. I feel bad there. Sorry. I thought I was going to. I think he is gonna go for a drink at that pan. If I do get that side, I think I might scare him away, and I don't want to do that. 
because you know when they get when they want a drink they are very tentative on bending down to have a drink because they're always very nervous for any predators around and sometimes they actually don't even have a drink they kind of just uh, give up and walk away I don't want to do that to him I think I'm waiting for him to rather have his have his water let's see yeah there he is he's going down oh he was going to see he's still very nervous he wanted to bend down there now oh, there he goes is he going to get there Nope. He's trying again. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. There he goes. Oh, he's just about to die. All right, well. All right, let's head over to Tess to see what's happening with her safari. We are definitely getting lucky with all of the big things today, it seems. As the afternoon's wearing on, the heat is kind of dissipating a bit. And now everything is coming out. This big boy is a one-tusk wonder. He's on Gauri Dam. I'm very happy we came this way. He is one of the biggest bulls I've seen on Juma in a while. He's got such a wide forehead, wide trunk. He's just huge. I'm hoping he's going to keep coming this way. Yes, there we go. As he gets closer, Oh, never mind, pausing to feed. But as he gets closer, you might notice he's half wet, half dry. He's bathing somewhere. I think he found a puddle. Maybe he came from Chelapan. But he found a bit of mud. And just like he's swinging that grass, he would have done the same thing with water and splashed. It looks like just his underside. Unless the sides are already dry, which is very likely. But you can see in the creases of his arms, he's wet under his chin. Right the way down his belly, down to his penile sheath, he is just so coated in mud. And I'm sure it's to help with the heat and also things like that rhino tick that we had just now. Pests, parasites, whether it's flies, ticks, spiders, anything like that, the mud helps to protect his skin. You can kind of rub it off and take the parasites with. And on such a hot day, being such a big boy, I'm sure he was getting hot. So he must be feeling nice and cool standing in the breeze like that, the mud slowly drying off in those creases. Amazing. I don't know if I've seen this bull before. I don't recall seeing many bulls with one tusk on Juma. But remember, elephants move massive distances, so he could have come from anywhere. My best guess is he lost that tusk in a bit of a fight with another bull. Clashing the tusks and knocking one. Austin, a birth defect is definitely an option. Um, so you do find mutations in certain animals and accidents do happen where they might be born with fewer teeth or more teeth by accident. I am an example of that. I was not born with the same amount of teeth as other people. So it's definitely possible that it could have been from birth. Um, it does look like though, hello big boy, do I need to move out of your way? Yes, potentially. Let me give you some space, big one. It does look like there is still a socket. So like a little pocket where the tusk used to be. So I'm guessing he had one at some point. And that he probably lost it a little while ago, whether it was through a fight or maybe even through knocking on a tree, anything like that. But um, are you going to keep coming? Okay, I'll keep going. But it looks like it was there at some point. There is a hollow 
in the lip. Still coming. Alrighty, we shall move for you. Oh no, we are on your pathway. Very mean of us, isn't it? We are right on the road for you. So the tricky thing with an elephant like this is because he has splashed himself, we can't see if he's actively dribbling any fluids from his penile sheath, but we can see he doesn't have anything coming from the temporal glands. Ah, you're gonna keep coming? Okay, let me move right out of your way then. <laughs> Give him the road to walk on, hey? Would be the politest thing to do. I'm sure he wants to come down and have a drink. How good would that be if we got him drinking? Oh, you're going to turn there. You just wanted to get to the crossing. Fair enough, I'll take it. We'll watch you from here then. Are you going down the crossing? Maybe, maybe not. He looks like he's just about to come down into this dip, so we'll give him right of way down into the dip. But it did look like there was a bit of a socket where tusk used to be. Normally, if an elephant has one tusk, in all likelihood, it will have another one. So... I'm guessing it got knocked. Remember, genetically, elephants are also coming out now with no tusks. But if he had that gene, he would have had none, not one. Yes, here he comes. Yay, I can see him moving. It's just a bit of a gray blur behind the bushes. He probably wants to come down to the side of the dam and he's using the easiest access. Oh no, you're coming back this way. Oh, never mind then. All right. <laughs> he's gonna pop up next to us again, Panda. He's playing games. That's what he's doing. He's playing games with us. Hello, big boy. Are you gonna stop there and feed? No, you're coming. Oh, he is so muddy. You are beautiful, big boy. Beautiful. And off we go again. <laughs> so he's not being aggressive at all. If he wanted to be aggressive, his ears would have been out. He would have been rumbling at us. He would have been doing all sorts of things. We are purely just respecting him by moving out of his way, giving him right of way down to the dam. Oh, rusty. And he's kind of just reminding us, hey, I'm the big one here. What are you doing in my way? So he just keeps walking. We give him right away and he carries on. No aggression at all. But you can see what he's done now that the angle's changed. Look at that water dripping down the inside of his shoulder. He splashed behind his ears to cool him down faster. <coughs> so that water behind the ears is the closest to that, that vein and artery network, the blood network. So that's cooled him down nice and effectively and it's still kind of dripping. So he definitely found a puddle somewhere on the way to the dam. Well, we're going to hope that he goes towards the little pan or the dam. We're going to follow him and see if he drinks. And we'll send you to Cedric with his giraffe in the meantime. Yeah, well, it looks like Tess has got a bit of elephant coming or going down to the water. And I've got a giraffe that's here still on the Niala South. It's just come up now. Just had a bit of a, a drink. I'm not... I'm just uh, whispering a little bit because, you know, as I said, they are very nervous when they go and drink. So if there's any noise if, or they feel a little bit threatened or scared or tentative on going down for that uh, drink, then they tend to just uh, r rather leave it alone. So I'm just waiting here patiently. I'm hoping he's going to bend down again and lean down for the, a nice drink of water. But he's a beautiful male, this. Absolutely stunning. It's about a good five and a half meter male, this. He's going to go down and see if he's a croucher or a spreader. So spreading sometimes, they'll put their legs, their front legs, they'll rather spread it sometimes. Or if they do the crouching uh, one, they'll actually kind of bend their knees almost like forward. And they're going to do a funny stance. Let's see. Let's see what he is. Oh, he's spreading. Oh. Yeah, he definitely uh, doesn't do the crouching. No, he's definitely not a croucher. Look at that. That is absolutely amazing. Such a tall animal. And you're going to 
you see when he comes up, he's going to flick his head and you see this beautiful stream of water that's going to come off his lips. Absolutely stunning. Oh, look at that. There you go. See that and all that saliva and water that comes off his lips there. It's amazing. Now what happens is, of course, they've got a thing almost like a sound they call it like a, like a blood sponge. So it's like a, a lot of blood vessels, very, very, very thin blood vessels, but a lot of them together like a sponge. And that's situated just below their brain. And of course, when they bend down, drinking water like that with of the blood in that so what happens that blood sponge actually regulates the blood flow from the heart to the brain and so when he flicks his head up like that it just actually almost like activates it again and uh, it helps him just to make sure that they're not going to pass out from all the blood flow and that blood pressure that's coming through like a little squirrel alarm calling here as well I mean a, a giraffe this size I mean it's about 1.4 1.5 tons and uh, their heart, they've got the largest heart out of all the land mammals. And you're looking at a heart of around about 11 or 12 kilograms. And that's a huge heart. I mean, 11 or 12 kilograms is quite a large heart. And it beats up to about 160 beats per minute. So about 160 beats per minute. And uh, so it just shows you that it's a very, very, um, how can I say, complex heart system that the giraffes do have. But yes, let's head over to Kevin, as he's got a flock of birds. We've actually got quite a special sighting. Oh! <laughs> How quick did he get up? I'm just going to have you got him, BK. Yeah, I'm just... yeah, you're gonna... yeah. Guys, yeah, uh, seeing ostrich here in Medikwe, quite a rare sighting for us. And you even more rare to see two males walking together here. It's going a little bit into the sun now. And that one was having a dust bath, just as he joined us. Might have to follow them, follow them a little bit just to get BK into a better position to show. Yeah, quite special to see them, yeah. And rare to see two male ostriches together. They are very territorial animals. That pitch. Black dog, plumage, look at them picking berries off that brandy bush. Huh? They are predominantly herbivores. Seed? Berries, as you can see him doing there, seed, roots, flowers. Now the light is catching them nicely, BK. Nathan, a male ostrich will not tolerate another male ostrich in his territory so um, they will uh, very aggressively chase them away um, and persistently uh, <laughs> I've seen uh, one male ostrich chase another one for over a kilometer non-stop so um, it is not so much an assertion of dominance it is actually just avoiding each other completely and one will just chase the other one away so the dominant one in the area will chase the less dominant one away that is basically how they exert that dominance
and even stranger, both of these uh, ostrich males will start developing uh, this uh, breeding uh, coloration. And you very often see that on, on their shins, they turn this pinkish salmon color. And uh, both of them actually has got it, so... Which makes it even more strange that they are two males walking together because they are both both starting to come into that seasonal colors so that testosterone everything must be building up that was very cool i'm so glad we can show you that This is what I love about lionesses. Oh, look at this interesting structure with a termite mount and a dead leadwood. Now the question always is, does the tree grow on the termite mount or does the termite mount grow around the tree? Is the question. Alright. It's both. It's both. Right, so if you look at the termite mount, it's a very nice one. But it's only got, you know, the cone. There's not a lot of elevation here, which doesn't necessarily suggest it's a very old one can be however this leadwood has been dead and we know these can stand for ages so this in this case very likely the turbot mount grew around it but in most cases it's the other way around the tree actually grows on an existing termite mount it germinates on the termite mount there's a great example there by leopard dam that massive massive bourbon there you can clearly see elevation termite mount and then the tree is right on top it's not growing in it it's growing on top of it so it germinated there at some stage during the production of this mount remember this is a progressive thing it takes ages in this case i think it's probably the other way around but you can never say for certain remember these termite mounts can also be ancient i mean look at how hard this is this is like rock but it is active it is active we can see some new construction up here and even there has not been weathered down like this 
You'll see, so this mount is active. There's, there's, there's termites in there. There's definitely termites in there. You got this big old leadwood. Don't know how long it's been standing here, this skeleton as such. I mean, some have been carbon dated to have been dead for 500 years. Although, some studies have suggested the average, I can't say lifespan, but period that leadwoods skeletons remain in the bushes are roughly about 80 years. And this will all depend on where they stand. Remember, there's regular fires that comes through here that ignites these things. So along river courses where there's not a lot of fire, you could probably find these things can stay dead for hundreds of years. All right, I'm going to continue looking for some stuff in the south here. Let's go over to Trish to see if there's any success on her lion tracking. It goes well. These lions, you can see there's a very impressive male there. And then there's the older of the two lionesses that we have on Amakala sitting with him. Isn't he gorgeous? He is... I mean, we're very far away from it. At the moment, we're pretty much zoomed in as much as we can to see him because they're in the middle of, of the block. Oh, look at that. Morgan's going to show you just how far away um, from them we are. So they kind of smack bang in the middle of where it's very difficult to see them. Look at that. This is a... <laughs> it just keeps on going and keeps on going and keeps on going. And that's it. So it's it's pretty far away, but also there are no access roads um, to that area. That would take us any closer and and then i think that it would it would actually benefit us if they start to move to see exactly where they go and on the other side of this of this ridge or this hill is where we were sitting with those zebra and the other antelope in that area so if we see them moving on that side we at least know exactly where to go how did i spot them you ask i did not somebody else spotted them uh, and then we came to join them and then we looked and we finally found found them you've got to have some really special eyes in this property to find these animals it's a talent because there's no off-roading it's difficult to look for tracks and the blocks are quite quite big oh you're very tired. Well, all the yawning is um, a good indication of possibly some movement soon. Did you see how impressive that mane is? Wow. So I haven't seen this male lion before. I've seen the lionesses, but I haven't seen this male and he is utterly impressive. I think he's a bit self-conscious now that I've mentioned how beautiful he is. <laughs> And now all we have is a little, a little tail. All right, but we're going to stick around here. We're going to send you over to Tess and see how her lion search is going. And I'm sure in just a matter of time, there'll be some movement on our side. I hope you managed to get a, a better view, Trish. It would be awesome to go to the other side. It's always fun when you spot them from a distance. My lion search, I mean, I'm one step closer. I found something that's kind of tawny. That's about as close as I've gotten. <laughs> We've got some impalas, yay. Now they are having quite a serious fight at the moment. I want you to have a listen. You can hear their horns interlocking. I uh, just uh, confirm. A negative, they crossed north just east of Mvuba Road on Bifelsuk cut line. Oh, 
Copy that. You're the Nyari. We're at Gari Dam at around 9 a.m. this morning. Oh, I have stopped. So someone's looking for those buffaloes and they're trying to figure out where to go and track them in Biffleshook. <clears throat> so we were just telling them where, we, where they crossed and what kind of time they were last seen. Oh, chase each other around the tree. Oh, that one looked quite serious. Ian, yes, they absolutely can lose horns while sparring like this. If it gets very serious, they can snap the horn right off. Usually one at a time, so they might break one, try and fight again, break another one. But you can see why, with the slight curvature of the horn, when they, oh, like that. They interlock like that, it can be really serious. Any quick, sudden movement might snap a horn right off, any hard impact. And that is quite painful for them. The inside of the horn is an extension of the skull, it's bone. So it's breaking a bone off of your head. It doesn't grow back and it severely reduces the chances of being successful in winning fights and therefore in mating. I can hear another pair fighting. So it's not just this, this duel happening, there is another one, but I think behind the bushes. So the males are already starting to get ready for the rut in May. The lambs are only just being born and the males are already organizing that hierarchy. Wow. a lot of energy chasing each other around bouncing wow <laughs> so Jared in my ears was he saying he's loving how they kind of clash and then both look up at the same time and it's very much like that there's the other pair well spotted panda the other pair that's fighting so what they're doing is sizing each other up but also being safe because if you just clash horns all the time you're going to be in trouble if there's something coming like those lions or a leopard because you're distracted you're making noise you're not aware of your surroundings so not only do they size each other up and then estimate or guess when the other one's going to make the next move so they can synchronize and do the move at the same time but they also want to be careful that they're not oh what have you heard that you're both looking this way want to be careful that they're not making themselves extra vulnerable to predators. Amazing, that mood changed quite quickly. Uh, we might be back on. No, the mood has changed. I don't know why, but something caught their attention. So we're going to stick around and see what happens. Maybe they've heard something we haven't. And we'll hopefully see them fighting again just now. Standing by. We 
You can hear a lot of vocalizations from the other impalas standing by. Uh, it sounded like Sips was on the property just now, but he crossed out. He went to go and look for this nyari. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Abe. <clears throat> so there's a lot of movement happening right now. And it just got a little bit more interesting because now there are four males together. I wonder if they're going to change fighting partners. Do a bit of a round robin. That's normally how they do it. So everyone needs to fight everybody. They determine a hierarchy. And that hierarchy stands right the way through to the rut. There's more serious fights in the rut. They can actually kill each other. It can be fatal. And then the most male can take on the dominant male of the harem, the highest ranked male. Standing by. Oh, doesn't want to chat. <laughs> okay. Looks like we've split into two going right there. The other two have gone left. Are we going to fight again? Or are they just following each other around? So the intimidation tactic really works with impalas. The one that walks away from the fight or moves back is the less dominant one or the one that is losing the fight. Then, once that has happened, the more dominant one will follow. So that one you can see behind the tree was the first one to retreat. The other male is coming up behind him on the left. So just keeping that pressure on. Keeping the pressure on, showing that there's still a bit of dominance. They want to keep pushing each other. And this is going to continue for the next five, six, seven months. So it'll be interesting to see when it's the full rut, how many pairs we have fighting up here. Yeah, I'm at Bifelzucker Dam and uh, it's definitely quite a serene and uh, tranquil feeling here at this uh, watering hole. But we do have got a yellow-billed stalk and it's just slowly wading through the water. And of course, you can see they're beautiful, absolutely stunning with the white and that yellow beak and the red face. And just going to puts its beak into the water, it opens its beak and it's waiting for any little bit of movement that's around there and as soon as it feels some movement it's going to of course snap the beak together and of course catch that prey, so like a fish or a frog or some sort of maybe all. So yes, that is nice just to watch them. There was uh, two, I think Tess said there was two, not yesterday, the day before, a pair that's uh, been Seen here at Buffalook Dam. I'll just see the one for now. I love it. The long legs, long beak, all very much built for exactly what it's doing now to go into the deeper waters. And of course, send that beak nice and deep into the water as well. I'm looking, I'm just wading through there. So sometimes I'll do try and unsettle the sediment that's sitting at the bottom and sometimes you'll find things like tadpoles or frogs that's sitting or like we call them here in South Africa we call them plat unders. Plat unders is like a little frog that also hangs around the water areas and uh, of course when it does move its feet through there and disturbs that sediment sometimes those little froggies will of course swim off and then will grab it. A bit of a breeze coming through here, very nice breeze actually, very welcoming breeze. Love it. Definitely a very tranquil scene now. So I think there might be a bit of wind in my mic. I'm going to try and put my cap down a bit. But so we haven't seen many a uh, many a uh, hippo coming through to this dam. I have seen tracks coming here, but it looks like, as I said, every time it seems like these uh, hippos are turning around from this side and they go back north again into Buffalook. But the water, uh, the water level is getting quite low. I 
And actually, the wild dogs chased uh, a full, uh, full uh, grown female impala that was pregnant into this dam. And of course, that impala tried to swim to the one side and they chased it from the other side, coming back again. And it was like that back and forth. And there was a hippo that was inside. And of course, this hippo was pretty much trying to chase this poor impala out out of the water, but it chased the impala straight into the wild dog's uh, mouths and uh, they grabbed it and of course at that time those wild dogs had uh, pups that were around about maybe Sorry about that, I think uh, by accident I bumped my mic back there. But yeah, and as uh, so wild dogs took uh, the, the impala out of the water and then they of course killed it and it was a little feet because it, that's, it was pretty much this time of the year and it was quite incredible seeing, oh here comes, oh look at this in front of us. Uh, there's a big buffalo that's just coming here. Uh, uh, he's limping, a big male buffalo, but he is limping quite badly. Sorry, he's just meow. Oh, front front leg, not looking too well. You can see a bit of a sprain on the on the joint there. Quite thick his leg. Mm. I wonder if we get that. the lions coming now and they see a buffalo uh, looking like this. I'll definitely take that opportunity and it's just by himself, so an old male can't keep up with the herd. Oh, is he gonna get down there? I think that oh he almost slipped. Don't slip. Slowly. Mm. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I just hit my side against the thing, the box. Don't worry, I'm, I'm fine. I just hit my uh, hit my wind out there. There's a little black box in the centre, yeah, and, uh, and Paul chased me to the side, yeah. <laughs> well, at least it got down to the water. That's a good thing. But yeah, as I say, this is very uh, for a male like this, and, and no idea what happened to the leg, the front left leg, but. Uh, Definitely, and they've got those lions in the area as well. I think uh, Tess might still be following up on those lion tracks. That's just to the west of us. So yeah, it'll be very interesting if they see this big male buffalo looking a little bit sore. I don't see any other problems with him. I don't think he was chased by lions or attacked by lions. I can just see it doesn't look like he's got any cuts on him or anything like scars. Just a sore leg. It just shows you. So sitting at the dam, all of a sudden things can change very quickly. Sorry, Jared, I did not copy you there. My comms is just not on. Go again. Oh, yes, no, definitely. Sorry, I'm just trying to get a little bit comfortable here. Yeah, no, this uh, male definitely. It doesn't look like he's had any water for for a bit, uh, maybe for the entire day, the way he's drinking at the moment. I think he's definitely quenching his thirst. All right, yeah. Well, it looks like even his tail's half. It looks like he's got a half a tail. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, I can see. Definitely is one of these uh, males you do not want to mess with. I think he must be the grumpiest buffalo. Definitely grumpier than Chris's buffalo today. Because even his nose, he's picking that nose up. And oh, he's a big boy. He is definitely he's, he's quite large as well. I don't think that's. I don't think that that injury. You can see that front left leg is quite swollen. I don't think that's a, an old injury. I don't think. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, he's, he's, oh. What's he doing now? Just, maybe he wants to lie down a bit. Definitely pulling a crab motion here, yeah, going sideways into the water. Very interesting, then. Huh? A little bit, uh, a little bit light on his uh, hooves at the moment. Hmm. Trying to turn around. He's struggling to turn around. He's big. I mean, look at the shoulders on him. It's like just his body. He's a full, full grown male. This, you know, like a good maybe 900 kilograms to a ton. I mean, he's definitely a full size. And maybe he's just completely left behind the rest of the herd that's gone north into Biffle's Hook. But sometimes these old males as well, they will tend to peel off from those big herds. But I think more this one is, uh, he can't keep up because of that leg. And maybe you'll have, maybe have two or three males together, just to kind of protect each other, like safety numbers. So in case if there is any lions, at least he knows, he's, he knows that he's got uh, some backing. Let's see if he's going to try and get out here now. Yeah, he doesn't want to stand on that leg. I don't know what he wants to do. What's he doing? Oh, he wants to lie down maybe in the water. Oh, okay, get a little bit comfortable. I think he wants to maybe rest a bit. There has been a little bit of movement on our side in these lions. There's a lot of yawning and of course the obligatory defecating. Not any stretching just yet, but at least there's some movement. So usually when lions are sitting in a patch of shade and there isn't a lot of movement at all and they're lying in a little cuddle puddle, what we look for is this kind of short burst of movement. Like she may walk from one patch of shade to another and then sit down there and then in between, oh look at her. You're such a good lioness. And then in between there's lots of stretching, yawning, um, urinating and defecating. And they kind of all do that until the time is right for them to, to actually start moving. I'm just going to, uh, I think, roll forward a little bit. Morgan shouted at me and said no. <laughs> no. <laughs> he didn't shout. He didn't shout, no. Um, and just trying to make a think about the other people in the um, in the sighting, but it seems that everybody is just fine. We are very lucky to have this camera that allows us to have a good view because I had to watch them through binoculars um, earlier. But again, this speaks to the fact that we get to watch them from such a distance that it really allows them to behave in a way that 
maybe they wouldn't if we were if we were closer gorgeous all right let me send you over to tessa and uh, juma she's got something interesting in a termite mound i wonder what it could be i'm gonna guess dwarf mongoose I don't know what has got the kudus so highly strung, but it is quite entertaining to watch. All of them on one termite mound, looking very uncomfortable. You do not see kudus bunched up like this together for no reason. They're using the termite mound as a vantage point so they can see further. But they've all been staring. And when we first spotted them, actually Panda spotted them, they were all staring across towards almost the link road down to Zoe's road from quarantine. See, kind of down to the left, that's where they're looking. There was an impala that emerged with two lambs from that area and we thought that they were looking at the impala and then the impala came and went and they just carried on staring. So there's something else that they're hearing there that's still got them feeling a little nervous. I think the scent of the lions has been swirling because we're very close, we're just south of Gallico Pan, we're very close to that area where the lion tracks were. I think the smell is swirling and I'm hoping now that it's cooler, maybe the lines are moving and they were in that drainage line. So where we were with the elephant and looking for the lion tracks is directly behind the kudus. If you go down to the other side, past those very green trees to the kind of silverish looking ones, that's the other side of the drainage line. So down on that side, past that dip. I mean, it just looks so comical. I don't think I've ever seen so many kudus on one tiny termite mound. So she's relaxed, coming to join. I wonder if she's going to stand up there and do the same thing, just start staring. Even some of the impalas are staring, so we are definitely going to be sniffing around here. Something's going on. We're playing the CSI game now. She's also looking. But I'll send you to Cedric with his injured buffalo, and I'll keep looking on the side. <laughs> That's fantastic. Maybe not a termitarium, maybe a kuduterium. That uh, Tess has uh, stumbled across, uh, upon there. <laughs> but yeah, we are still sitting here with our very uh, grumpy male uh, Cape Buffalo. And uh, yeah, when he did come to the water, you didn't see he had a, a bad left swollen leg. And uh, I think he's just going into the water now just to kind of maybe relieve a little bit of pain. Maybe just sort of lying in there and just feeling a little bit more comfortable having a bit of nice water that's running over those, that swollen leg. But it looked like he was stumbling a little bit, but he's still picking up his nose now and again. He's definitely not a happy boy. You can see in those eyes. That is now somebody that I do not want to walk into at all on a walk. Definitely not. But it's all by himself here. And I'm just looking around, you never know, there's now you're going to get these tawny cats that's going to be all of a sudden popping out here and they've been following this guy. So I'm definitely going to hang around here and just keep my eyes peeled for that, which will be quite interesting. And yeah, the beautiful woodlands kingfish in the background going crazy and having his beautiful calls going that side. Absolutely stunning having those fishes back again but look at that uh, even with the silhouette in the water looks interesting so well, his reflection looks pretty nice I enjoy that a nice set of horns on him as well
Well, we're going to sit with this uh, grumpy male uh, buffalo. Let's head over to Madikwe, to Kevin, and see what he's got to show us. Right, I'm going offline. Just keep coming north. Yes, we were, we are on a cat mission, cat finding mission. More specific, we found a pride of lions for you in the beautiful late afternoon sun. Boy is lying here to your right. Yes, one, three cubs, two lionesses for you. They were actually um, where they were found previously. Some very stick, uh, thick, a thick mellifera, uh, black thorn thicket, and few that uh, they opened just as we arrived. So all going to plan. Let's sit and see what happens. <laughs> Yes, there are tawny cats, and especially, you know, I think it's for us as well. It, it, uh, the tawniness, is that the word? Yeah, the tawniness actually stands out quite more. Tawny cats in the green. Elephants are one of those few animals that you can watch all day without ever finding a moment where there's nothing that's interesting you about them. Register for free on our website or on our app and get stuck into all the excitement of live wildlife viewing. Ask our expert guides your questions, learn more and enjoy this community of animal-loving people all in real time. Wild Earth, connecting you naturally. And 
just as this cub is standing up, I wanted to say to you what I normally find with lions. They uh, they initially wake up. Oh, this is uh, look at curiosity kills the cat. Yeah, look at this. I'll tell you now. Let's just look at this. Looks in the region of about a year, a year and a few months. Big boy is all. Now just look at that majestic beast. Now, just look at that. Now what I normally find when lions get first get active, they get up and they move and then they, they hit the snooze button and they have another little snooze before they really get active. So it's almost like a false wake up call. Down again, have a snooze. And when they, when they get mobile now, that it will be them for the evening on the move. And I also find that the cubs normally lose patience first, so they will start playing around. Even normally not, you do sometimes get what you call, well, lack of a better word, they run. But Mother Nature does that normally. If that if that say if that cub is really too weak to follow or keep up with the pride, nature normally looks after that. Uh, so the pride itself won't push a cub out. Um, it will only be when that individual is too weak, can't follow, um, that they will basically call it be left behind. But lions are very social animals, there is a strong bond within a lion pride. They will try and look after that weak, up to the point that nature will take, will take, I hope I explained that correctly. Proud dad. So this is the dark main brother of the normally see. <laughs> Tarun, thank you. Yes, I'm glad you had cat withdrawal symptoms as well. So yes, hopefully that we've had our until tomorrow that is. <laughs> Every single morning we've got symptoms, isn't it, Tyron? We can never get enough of them. Mine going into the life, and I know uh, Juma lost a dear member in the dark mine, but hopefully, the legacy is albeit in a different reserve. the world. Be fooled. King lions know exactly what's happening around them. We are going to stay with them until they wake up and then we will see you shortly. In the meantime, we're going to Cedric back in his buffalo. Nice, Kevin. Um, it'll be nice to imagine having your lions at the Buffalo Zook Dam now with this buffalo. That would definitely be quite exciting and very interesting to see what would happen. And Because this uh, buffalo is a little bit uh, sore on the one leg, as I said, and uh, it'll be quite interesting to see how this buffalo will react to the lions. So as I said, I'm still just going to hang back here. It is getting a little bit darker now, slowly but surely. And I think uh, I'm hoping that 
The cats will start moving around now. I think, I'm not too sure, I think Tess is still on the tracks of those lions. I think she's still trying to follow up on them. I know she had a whole lot of kudu on top of a termite mound, but it would have been nice if it was lions on top of a termite mound. Yeah, but being alone like this, very, very vulnerable for now. There's a lot of alarm calls of birds in the background, like uh, the Franklins and... Oh, it looks like he wants to roll over. Oh, no, maybe don't roll over, not a good idea. He might struggle to get up again. Yeah, definitely alarm calls coming out just north of us. Not too sure for what. Maybe it could be a bird of prey, it could be a slender mongoose, leopard, lions. No, no idea at this point in time. As I said, I am definitely waiting here patiently. He's sniffing the air. I don't know what he's picking up. I also have a very good sense of smell, so those big nostrils. Nice boy, you are a little bit sore. Mm -hmm. I know that the rest of the herd Tess had their tracks going into Belfastville, not too far west from where we are now. And they went north. So I wonder if this male wasn't part of that herd and he was just kind of couldn't keep up anymore and he fell fell behind and he decided to come here towards the dam. Uh, Thomas, yes, from sparring, as well from uh, rubbing it against uh, trees. So you'll find uh, many times buffalo, especially the males, uh, they'll actually kind of rub those horns against the trees just to kind of strengthen uh, their horns quite a bit. And that's almost like a callus. So, of course, the more you, um, then I, I can say, play tennis or, you know, holding a racket or something like that, you, know, you start getting those calluses. So it's the same as a buffalo. So a buffalo will always kind of rub their horns against trees and bushes and all that. And you can see a little bit of the, the bark that's sitting on top of the horns itself. A little bit of that red and brownish color to it. It looks a little bit more relaxed now, but I'm still thinking there's something around here. Just got this little hunch. You still see, I still, this is just a little sniffing the air. So I'm trying to see which uh, the wind direction is coming pretty much from the north to the south. Lovely. Well, I can't say sunset because it's already down, but those colors are again just surreal. And we've got just a tiny peak of some of the northern stretches of the escarpment showing there. It's not Maripskop, it's further south. This is looking directly west. And of that dead knobthorn in the foreground, it's just a very typical African scene. Let's just have a quiet moment and just enjoy that. Lovely. Like I always say, it's just that time where you just reflect on the day. Oh, 
And like I said, as soon as we're done here, we would um, just take a minute or so to equip and employ our infrared capability. And then we're going to be looking for some leopard. It's a hot afternoon, so they were unlikely to have moved early on. Now is the time when they're going to start moving. All right, let's start rigging that IR and go look for leopard. That sounds like a great plan, Chris. Get all your equipment ready. I think that you're going to get a last minute leopard. I hope that you do. Our lions have not moved too much, but they are edging into the sun a little bit more, which is, I think, really nice. I'm hoping it indicates some movement soon. But even still, we don't need animals to move to appreciate them. Just as they are, they're quite majestic. So now in front of us we have the collared female and then behind her is the male that's come out from behind the bush and now is being um, obstructed by the female. Wow, it's gotten quite windy. I found though that once the sun sets the wind subsides quite significantly and I'm hoping that the same will go for for today and we might have a small problem once the sun starts to set too much because we're zoomed quite in I don't think our IR is going to help us too much given the distance of the sighting if they were like 10 meters in front of us <laughs> as Morgan says if they were in 10, me 10 meters in front of us that would have been fabulous if they were just yeah. there <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me send you back over to Juma with Cedric and his buffalo. All right, here we are. He's just uh, he's trying to get that left leg. Oh, he's going to struggle on that left front leg. As you can see, he doesn't want to put. Oh, he doesn't want to put any. Oh, shame. Uh, he's definitely in pain. Let's see what he's going to do. I wonder if he wants to go lie back into the water or if he wants to try and get out now. Well, he has to get out sooner or later. He's just looking around, but look how big and look how thick his neck is. As I say, he's a definitely he's quite a beast, this one. Oh. Let's see. Yeah, he is. I wonder, I think maybe he wants to lie down again. So just going to take a look quickly. Um, but he's definitely struggling to put any any weight on that uh, front left. It looks more like a sprain, like a sprain or something, not a break. Because when I looked at it, it's very swollen. Maybe a break, it could be. I'm, well, I'm not really a specialist at that, but yeah, let's see. Oh. You can you can do it. There you go, there you go. Oh, uh, oh it doesn't fall over. There we go. He's he's managing. He's managing. But I'm just hoping for him that he does not bump into lions tonight, that's all. I think he'll have to walk towards that inflow. It'll be the best and the easiest for him. Oh, 
And sometimes they might have happened by running away from something or, you know, fighting with another male who never... Uh, dark pain lover, I'm not too sure. It depends on the, 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 the severity of the injury. Um, I mean, I'm saying he's putting on pressure, so I don't think it's really a break. He's not hopping, you know, he's still putting a little bit of pressure on it. So um, it could take maybe, uh, if it's a sprain, like a week or two. Uh, that's like, I mean, uh, I'm, just, I'm just taking a far guess now. Um, but, you know, animals are very resilient. Uh, they really kind of come back uh, from injuries very quickly. Um, if they don't, well, they are going to be pretty much vulnerable to uh, predators. So they you now have to make sure that he's not going to, if, you know, he needs to heal up quick, quick. And uh, it looks like, I mean, with that weight as well, you must understand, you've got 900 kilograms that you're putting on a leg that's kind of now sprained or you know, injured somehow. Of course, it's, it's not going to be comfortable. It's going to take a bit of time. But it's definitely hindering his movements. That's one thing. So it's definitely going to stop him from keeping up with the rest of the herd. And eventually, of course, being by himself like this, even if it's with other males, it'll be also, you know, if they move off to another watering hole or to another area, he's, he's all behind. He's going to go, I don't know why he wants to go up that bank there, because he wants to go up that bank, he's going to, he's going to struggle to go up there. Let's see. He's, uh, he's busy now working it out. Is he going to get it right or not? I'm going to try it. Oh, he's going up. He's going up. All done, boy. Well, there you go. As long as he's not going to roll down again. All right, looks like he's now pretty much moved out of sight for us. But, yeah, while well, we're still sitting here, we've still got our beautiful healable stalk. All right, well, we're going to continue. We must be up towards Biffleswick Dam. Let's head over to Kevin, as he's got his lines. Glad our dugger boy made it out of the mud. Here in Medikwe, uh, they have hit the snooze button for the second time. But patience will always pay off. The cubs actually moved off into the tall grass. And they were all lying on a heap there. I'm not sure if you can pick up on that bird call. There's a Swainson spur fowl that is not happy with the presence of the lions. Yeah, he saw the he saw the adults, but he hasn't seen the cubs yet. Now the cubs are all lying there on a heap. You see them there in the grass. And there's your Swainsons in the right hand side. Or he, maybe he has seen them. Look at him, he's not happy. Now that, that is Swainson's Spurfell talk for there's a lion, there's a lion. this time of the day where that changeover occurs between day and night. Swainson's having its last little feed before it goes and roosts. 
lions having their last little steep before they go and feed. I'm letting you, I'm just going to let you enjoy the early evening, late afternoon change over sounds, the different birds that start calling. I'm sure a frog or two will start calling soon. We are right here next to a seasonal pan, so I'm going to give you a minute or two just to enjoy it. That male is now around about five years old. Him and his brother. Thank you, Swainsons. Him and his brother has taken over control of this north northeastern region in Madikwe. I think you have seen, or you've definitely seen him before. Hopefully, um, he is that uh, magnificent blonde male. I'm not sure where he's walking around. So they are blood brothers, siblings. And yes, five years old, give or take a month this way and that way. Have you ever wondered what happens behind the safari? And jump! <laughs> Living in the wild can affect you. It's the smell that... And things don't always go as planned. I'm gonna start coming down. Whoa! <laughs> Download the Wild Earth app and join the crew behind the scenes. It's in your nature. The search is on again. After seeing those kudus and impalas, we did a quick trip down quarantine south, starting from the, the northwestern side. And we found 
leopard tracks. Some nice fresh ones. So that is what the kudus were looking at. That is what they were smelling. They could smell a leopard or they could see the movement of a leopard. I think they probably smelled it because the wind was coming from that way because there was an impala fairly close by to those tracks that was quite, I wouldn't say relaxed, but she definitely wasn't demanding and running to the rest of the herd. But there were nice fresh leopard tracks coming from Quarantine South onto Fuyatela Access. So we are now exploring this area going north. We've done a little bit of Galago again. Some eyes. It is, I think. Oof, a diker running away. So we've done a little bit of Gallagher again where we found more leopard tracks and then again we found lion tracks walking circles around us and we've done that stretch so now we're quickly doing Aubrey's Road towards the boundary and back along Sandy Patch. <sighs> the cats do not want to be found on Juma today. This is the perfect time of day that the light is super tricky for the eye. We're struggling to adjust. So even though I can see with my eyes without the lights, I can't see well enough. So I have to use the lights now. And imagine how that feels for something like an Impala that doesn't have artificial light that it can just have a quick scan. Their eyes are busy adjusting at the moment. So it is the time of day when methods are coming out. <laughs> Linda, never is a very strong word. We get lost all the time, um, particularly in the block, but actually on roads, it's just a matter of learning the road networks. So, and I, okay, maybe not completely lost either when we're off-roading, but um, yeah, it's a matter of learning the road network. So the best way to do it is you actually study the map and learn where each individual road is, the direction it runs in. Is it a north-south road or an east-west road? what are the roads that surround it and you've got to kind of try and picture it in your mind and then it's a matter of learning those roads when you're actually driving so whether it's in the day or the night you should know the road network and that helps a lot and then you know okay i found tracks here or i found say i found tavangumi right here and he disappeared east into this block so i know because Aubrey's is a north south road i know that if i'm here and i move east I'm going to pop up on Gallagher Shortcut eventually because that's the next road east. If I keep going east, if I turn north in the block, I'll end up on the fire break and Bifflesa cut line. So it's a matter of <laughs> learning the road network and most importantly, which roads connect to which and which way they move. Because if it's overcast, you can't rely on the sun to tell you whether you're facing north, south, east or west. You have to know the road network and where you are on the road. So. That's probably the biggest thing that you can do is, is just learning the map and then associating that with landmarks on each particular road. So all of these termite mounds that we have on Aubrey's Road, these are all landmarks. And I know that I'm going north because it's night time so I can't see where the sun is but I can see the sun has set on that side because it's lighter that side than this side so that's west, this is east. And Aubrey's is a north-south road. I started on Voyotela Access, so I'm moving north to Bifflesuk Pipeline on Aubrey's. So the roads themselves are actually pretty easy. Juma is a fairly small property with a really nice road network. If I compare that to Ngala, Ngala was 15 times the size of Juma. And quite a few more roads to learn. And then you get in trouble when you're kind of in between two roads in the block because those blocks can be a few kilometers by a few kilometers. So if you get yourself lost, you'll be in trouble. And a few times there, we had guides getting lost and then you have to call someone and say, I think I'm close to this road. I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to rev and I'm going to put my spotlight up in the air like this. Please tell me if you can see me. You see the light and you say, OK, I'm on Hyena Road. You're kind of northeast of me. Your closest road is probably three times. Keep going north and you'll get to three times. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a matter of guiding people in and out in those big blocks. But yeah, especially at night, if you're not concentrating and you are off-roading after a cat and you're not concentrating on which direction you have been going in, you'll go in circles. 
you've got to hope that the leopards or lions walk in a very straight line and that you're paying attention when you're off-roading. But I'm hoping to still find some leopards or lions tonight. For now though, Kevin still has his lions. <laughs> so head over and enjoy them. <clears throat> yes, Tess, that has happened to me plenty of time as well. Exactly as she was saying, you uh, you get so caught up in the moment that you don't concentrate where you're going and then all of a sudden you go, especially when it's very flat and featureless or dense bush, you go, oh, I've got no idea. <laughs> it's happened to all of us. <laughs> Hopefully not tonight when we make our way out of this line sighting where they are still very much flat. For all of you that has maybe just joined us you are here in Madikwe with Kevin and BK and we are playing the patient game we're gonna wait until these lines start getting mobile And in most instance of instances, I find that patience pays off. <laughs> Patrick, there is normally a pecking order which starts with the oldest lioness, the matriarch of the pride, and she normally rules with a, firm, with a firm hand, and she keeps most of them in line. Now with the males, ultimately when the males are with a female pride, they are not always with them, because remember males go off, they patrol their territory, they sometimes move between brides. So it's not that the males are always in attendance. When the males are in attendance, they will normally still be very wary of that matriarchal lioness. She rules the roost. And they'll, they'll be very wary of her. So it's normally resolved with a little bit of a scrap. Uh, maybe sometimes a grunt and a growl is enough maybe a poor slap is sometimes enough it very very rarely spills over to anything more serious than that within a pride where the members know each other mm, creepy crawlies Tess rather you than me let's go over to you That's so funny. Jarrett in my ear was just saying he's starting to itch from looking at these spiders. Just following on from that conversation with Trish earlier. And it is so true. You see something that you don't see as cute and cuddly and immediately you start feeling like your skin's crawling. Just like that rhino tick earlier. And I think it's something to do with eight legs. Spiders, scorpions, ticks. They all move the same way. And they look kind of creepy crawly, don't they? Now you're very lucky that you missed it as we got here. Because that really would have freaked, I think, a lot of people out. As we got here, that entire web on the right was just spiders. There must have been 50. And as we stopped the vehicle, they all just started going back towards the nest. And now there's just a few sticking out. These are community web spiders. Or community nest spiders. And they are on a mission to rebuild the catchment web something has come through this is the same one I've showed you before that was this massive catchment web like three four meters and something's come through and broken it and now they start the process again of rebuilding the catchment web there they come oh my goodness
This is so cool. So they're all slowly coming back out from the community nest. They are nocturnal spiders. It's one of the species here that we see mostly at night. And I've tried to show you a few times in the day and occasionally we get lucky. But we don't get lucky like this very often where you can see so many of different sizes. There are some massive spiders coming out now. Oh, and I have actually got something crawling on my arm while we're sitting here watching that. So as much as it looks really strange, these spiders are harmless to us. All spiders are capable of biting, but very few are actually harmful to humans or dangerous to humans. So if we leave them alone, they will gladly leave us alone as well. Their immediate defense, if you walked up to that web, would be to go back into the nest where it's safest. But it is just so fascinating seeing them all coming out in a group like this. One of the only teamwork spiders that we have in this part of the world. Emerald, exactly that. It is incredible to see social spiders. We really don't get to appreciate this very often. So this is a super, super cool sighting. Working together to rebuild the catchment web as quickly as possible because moths and things will be flying through at night. So they want to make this a really big, effective, tightly knit, or tightly spun catchment web. If it has to be big enough to feed so many spiders, then it has to be done very well. Oh, there's more at the top now. My goodness, this is awesome. Oh, and you can see the silk glinting. Look at that. Repairing all the holes in the existing web and adding whole new sections. Look at those three working together on the right. Are they feeding on something or are they... Looks like they might be carrying something. I think they've got some prey. Something flew into the web. I can't see what it is, but they've got some food. Oh, this is brilliant. So the catchment web has been successful. So what they do now is they share the meal. So those three are currently busy moving started feeding. a food triangle, a perfect triangle almost. I am very interested as to why the other spiders have not come to join the food party that's happening. Sandra these spiders are actually not as big as they look, so I know they look really, really massive on screen, and that's obviously, Panda's done a great job of, of zooming in. Um, they're not that big. The biggest one I've seen is probably about three centimeters long, from the tip of its legs to the tip of its legs when it's kind of standing normally. But that even would be a really, really big one. I'd say, on average, maybe about a centimeter and a half so really not that big <laughs> if you think about that in relation to the size of a coin most of them are, i suppose about the size of a two rand coin with their legs kind of splayed outwards so i suppose just slightly larger than most coins that you would have in your purse so they're really not that big i would get out and go and stand behind them for you so you can see the size in relation to me but with the infrared that wouldn't work very well because you wouldn't see the spiders anymore you'd only really see me 
But also, I don't really want to walk into them at night because I can't see where I'm going. <laughs> but, I mean, those are guari leaves to the left, I think. It looks like it might be guari leaves or oh, maybe a spikethorn. Those leaves are small. So these are not huge spiders. The scary part of it, I suppose, is the number of spiders in this instance. So I found it fascinating how they can use the existing silk network to expand and create new little kind of trusses, I suppose, between them, new little strands in a gap where there's none. So they're so good at using the existing network like that to climb, but they kind of keep the, the abdomen raised so that the silk doesn't accidentally attach where they don't want it to. And then they kind of attach it perfectly wherever they need to as they get to the correct piece of silk. Now all spiders here that we get are capable of silk. silk. <laughs> they all have spinnerets, so they're all capable of producing it, but very few actually build webs. Most spider species that you get in the world don't produce these big webs. So we're very lucky to see golden orbweb spiders, garden orbweb spiders, bark spiders, community nest spiders that do make extensive webs. The rest of them kind of live on the ground or kind of move around and hunt like solifuges, even baboon spiders or funnel spiders, trap spiders. That's not a, it's not a web. That's just a, a nest in the ground. Most of them use their silk just for protecting their eggs making a bit of a cocoon almost. Wow, look at them all coming out of that nest. You can see the denseness of that nest there. I mean, it just, it's mind blowing. Oh, there are some big ones coming out there. Those are probably females. The females are bigger than the males. The males are probably under a centimetre. The sun sets about half an hour later here with us on the western side of South Africa and Madikwe compared to over in Juma that's more on the east or oh, that's on the eastern side of South Africa so we've just still got enough light but in the meantime we meantime we've switched over to infrared right light already so in case when they start waking up that you don't miss a second and you can see that lioness is already sitting up it's a now about time we hope Okay, maybe not. <laughs> There's one thing you're definitely never going to get right, and that is rush a lion. Or try and know what happens, what's going on in a lion's mind. If you joined us three, four nights ago, you would have known they were, they were mobile very early. The sun was still up and they were already on the move. It's not as if they are overly full. Yes, they had a meal, but they're not completely full belly. So who knows what goes on in a lion's mind. I sometimes wish I knew. And they will get up here and walk, for instance, in a easterly direction. And we will all say, OK, tomorrow morning we're going to really locate on them in that and that area because they walked east when they got up. And the next morning they'll be all the way six, seven kilometers due west. So, <laughs> you do not rush a lion and you certainly do not, you'll never, 
you'll never be able to read the lion's, the lion's mind. You can hear the guinea fowl just settling in for the night. Something is they're not happy about. Alicia, yeah, they actually, it's actually not bedtime, it's actually wake up time for them now. They're just having a bit of a sleep in still. It is time for them to start getting mobile and active very soon. It's actually strange, Alicia, that the cubs haven't started playing around yet. They are normally the ones that lose patience first. And they start playing around and waiting for the um, waiting for the parents to get up and let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> so even the cubs are still almost not vis visible there in the long grass where they're lying. Lion Lady, now there's an appropriate name. Um, me personally not. I've personally seen lions climbing trees, but not sleeping in them like you get a, uh, like a leopard will do. But then I've seen photos and I'm not sure in exactly which reserve it is. I'm trying to remember where there's a pride of lions, very famous for climbing trees and lying in trees just like a leopard will do. I'm trying to remember the name of the, the reserve, but people travel it's, um, far and wide to actually go and see the specific tree, tree lying lions, lion lady, or almost had a tongue stumble there. You hear all these guinea fowls making their way to their roosting spots for the night. It's normally a noisy affair. <laughs> it's lovely, the temperature has just dropped. There is a spotted or a Water thickney that this came in, and there's our first frog starting up. Let me, I'm going to keep quiet, have a listen. Oh, that's actually not a frog. We've got a rufous cheeked nightjar. Sounds very frog like when they start up. That is your thick knee. Let's quickly go and see what Cedric has got for us. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, Kevin, I'm hoping for you as well that they get some action that side. I have got a spotted hyena busy chewing on something on Impala Plains. I'm not too sure what it's busy chewing on, but it's definitely digging into something that's lying there. As you can see, we are in infrared, so it, uh, we do not have any spotlights or any artificial lights. We just use the infrared on the camera, so it's pitch dark now, and that's what we see. 
I think for red light. Which is fantastic. I can't see what it's eating. I don't know what it's like I'm trying to figure it out, but it's only pulling on something there. Mm. Oof, yeah, I can see it's like I thought I saw a bone, like a big bone. Maybe dragged it from somewhere. I'm not too sure which character this is. I I not no idea. If anybody's got an idea, please let us know. And I'm um, oh no, he's doing nicely on that. Please let us know if you know this individual. Oh, it looks like something very tough. Mm. Yeah. Of course, very strong jaws, so especially with the hyenas getting through anything like hide and even bone. Um, they got, they're one of the, got one of the strongest uh, bite force out of most of the predators, yeah, so and they can get through a lot of thick bone. You can see it's trying to pull. You can see it's like trying to get in there and really pull whatever it's pulling on. I might try and get in a little bit closer soon. Bring it towards us. Ooh. It's coming, it's coming towards us. All right, let's head over to Chris in Pridelands. Apparently, he's had some luck this afternoon. I know we did have some luck. There's a leopard here. And, uh, so it might be a bit far for our, our IR light. It looks very relaxed. I actually want to try and get closer purely because it, it's a very distant sighting and we've got no clue who this leopard is I'm gonna just try and get around here quickly it seems very calm with our presence I'm just gonna try and reposition here at the edge of the water so I don't want to go directly to it I'm gonna take an arc Actually, be able to get a better view of it. Just careful not to drive into the dam. <laughs> That's not going to work, eh? Okay. Let's see if it's still there. Yeah, it's right here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we got it. It's right here. Right, that's a beautiful visual, eh? How is that? I cannot tell you who it is because I cannot even see the leopard. <laughs> so we do not have a monitor at the moment. So I'm purely going on what Odie's got. I just pointed out the leopard for him and he's doing. I might do. I've got a plan. I've got a plan here. Using the vehicle as a shield. I want to see what Odie's filming here. And I am, in fact. Now, I can see I've gone to the back of the car. How cool is that? A black and white leopard. Yeah, and even there, I can't really tell you who it is. I've got a very small screen here. But it's a leopard. That's the big thing. and very relaxed. Let's take a look. I'm sure some of our viewers who's got their big TV screens could potentially help us out with this one. Betty is so happy to see this last minute leopard. Betty, I am with you there. It's beautiful. 
right on in Glover Dam Wall. I told you this dam's going to be productive today. And the thing is, our camp is 50 meters from where we are. We aren't going to have to sleep tonight. Are you going to come visit me? I can't really get the spot pattern there. It looks like a relative animal. It could very well be. Oh, and it's got such a nice spot on the damn old flat. You can see there, and we illuminated it with the IR light. Remember that anything else can't see that. So it's got a bush there, so it can look down into the ravine as well as the dam itself. So that's a very good vantage point to sit and wait. Not only for creatures to hunt, but also for danger in the form of lions or hyena. Did you see that incredible sighting with Lauren and the wild dogs? Oh, and on the sunset show yesterday, Tessa saw my ribs. Are you someone who only has time for the best bits? Well, we have some great news for you. It's absolutely amazing. Download the Wild Earth app today and you can watch the best highlights from each safari show. Look at this. <gasps> every single day. Look at how fascinating this is. Wild Earth. My day is complete. I may not have found the leopard, I may not have found the lions, but I found a chameleon and spiders. I'm happy. <laughs> We've once again come full circle. We're very close to Galago Pan, and this massive flap necked chameleon is just hanging out right in the middle of a little bush, very close to the ground. But this is one of the biggest ones I've seen in contrast to the other ones we've found so far that have been fairly small. So this is definitely an adult chameleon, probably somewhere close to 
maybe 25 centimeters in length. It's a pretty big one. Hunched up like that though, curled into a little ball. It doesn't look as big. But again, just like the spiders, it's very difficult to convey size. But I suppose you'll just have to take my word for it. <laughs> So this is Wuyatela Access, close to Zoe's and Powerlands Junction. That's where we are at the moment. And so this is where we picked up those other fresh leopard tracks after looking at the kudu. And isn't it cool that leopards and chameleons share the same hunting strategy? Or a very similar one anyway? It's the stalk up and surprise strategy. They have to get really, really close to something to within range. and then they pounce, the chameleon with its tongue, the leopard with its claws. But very cool to see such a small little predator this late at night. I have been trying to have a look at its eye, so I'm obviously looking at quite a small little chameleon on my side because <laughs> I can't see it's dark. <laughs> but I am looking at what Panda has got on the monitor which is the same thing you are seeing and it looks like its eye is completely look like there's any pupil visible at all. So this little chameleon is having a really, chameleon is having a really good sleep. Now it is a lot cooler tonight than it has been. So you can also see that its tail is tightly rolled up into a little coil to keep that heat in. <laughs> Gavin, it is, it takes getting used to spotting chameleons at night, but the reason we can see them so clearly is because um, at night there's nothing to camouflage against because we can't see color. Everything is, is dark. So in the daytime when a chameleon can camouflage, it's very tough to see it in amongst all of the different shades of green. At night though, what happens is, because it can't camouflage, if you're looking at the spotlight, when you look at a leaf, what you see looking back at you when there's a chameleon is a very, very bright neon green. So it doesn't glow, but um, it almost has that effect, I suppose. I'm trying to find a, a good way to describe it. But basically, it's just a very different color. It goes back to its natural color, which is a, a very lime green. And if you compare that to the colors of the leaves and the vegetation we have here, there's not very much that's a lime green. Everything is darker or, or slightly more pastel, if that makes sense. So during the daytime, the chameleon can adapt and become more dark or more pastel. But at night, it's got nothing that it can use as a reference of what to adapt to. So it just goes back to its natural lime green. Also, I think because this particular one is a little easier, it's, it's right in the center on the side that's facing us. And it's a lot bigger than the rest of the structures on this particular little tree. So it's not the same size as the leaves or anything like that. It stands out quite nicely. But if it was in amongst some bush willow leaves, for example, high up, it would be much tougher to spot. But it's definitely a good skill to have. We used to have competitions when we were driving guests to see who could spot the most chameleons as the tracker was using his spotlight. But of course, it's always the tracker that finds the most <laughs> because he's directly behind the spotlight and knows where he's going to point it next. It's easier to follow. It's a little cheat. I'd love to know how old this chameleon is because they don't live that long. But this is a really big one. So maybe this one is already north of three, four, five years old. A baby chameleon hatching would be about the size of this chameleon's maybe nose to eye that distance. Tiny little things when they hatch. And then they've got to get a lot bigger.
But it is always nice to catch up with them regardless. Maybe one day we'll work out a system of how to age chameleons without actually having to watch them from the time they're born. Yes, definitely Tess, well, well spotted there. Always nice to have a chameleon on, a chameleon on screen. I'm just trying to look, see if I can find any other little and knock. Sorry, I just smelled something dead there. Nox, nocturnal critters. I thought I smelled something funny there. And like a little Janet as well. That's what I'm going to go towards uh, um, quarantine to see what's happening around that quarantine area. Let's see if we can maybe find a white-tailed mongoose that uh, they usually hang around there. Even those uh, beautiful African wildcats. I've been fortunate, well, I think I've been fortunate enough to see two that side, but every time they're very shy, they disappear before we can even get them on screen. So I'm just taking a look at a lot of tracks up and down here. Just to make sure I'm not going to miss anything. Yep. On Zoe's at the moment, and uh, yeah, there's so many. Oh, a little, hey, a little scrub here. Let me just kind of try and put the light off here. I don't want to. There we go, go across. It's a little one, a very small one. Sorry, I don't want you to get blinded here by us. Oh, I don't even have lights on. Oh, there's, there's my lights. There's so many like leopard tracks and that's around this side. This north uh, western corner of uh, Juma since this morning, it seems like there's been a lot of back, a lot of activity. Um, when it comes to lions, with the, the tracks of buffaloes, uh, leopards, a lot of tracks up and down, male, female. So there has been a lot of activity in this area the last night and early this morning. So I'm just hoping that. Maybe if not tonight, maybe tomorrow morning we are fortunate in getting something nice around the side. Um, some nice leopards. We are nearing the end of your sunset safari on this Monday afternoon slash evening now. The lionesses here in Madikwe has actually stood up and moved a bit off. We are waiting for big boys still. And every now and then he had his head up. Now, line lady, I was still scratching my head the whole time since your question about the trees and the, uh, the lines and the trees. And I had to think hard, and it's, yes, it is in Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth National Park there in Uganda, where you get that famous bride. But I'm lying. It is, it is in the Queen. <laughs> Elizabeth National Park, but uh, a good friend of mine actually sent me a message. Thank you for that, but I thought I'll just come back to you on that. It's almost completely dark now. There's a slightest little tinge of light still here in the western sky. The cubs are still lying on a heap here on our left hand side. In the tall grass we can't really see them. Oh, 
what an adventure that would be going to see those tree climbing lions. Definitely still on my bucket list. Very similarly, I have seen lions climb trees, but I've never seen lions sleeping in trees. I think pretty much everything would be very grateful that lions don't climb trees all the time and stay up there like leopards do, because they'd be much harder to spot. <laughs> But these impalas are the same ones that I was looking at earlier that, along with the kudus, showed me that there was a leopard or something around. But I did not have the luck today finding those big predators. That's absolutely fine, though. We had a fantastic afternoon looking at some of the more unusual things, that big elephant bull, the chameleon, the spiders, I think, were one of my highlights as well. And, of course, the impalas fighting. <laughs> Panda's got a bug or something on him. <laughs> but I think across the board it was really a lot of fun. Well done to Chris for finding that leopard. Well done to Cedric for the buffalo and the hyena. And of course Kevin with his lions as well. Very, very exciting stuff. It is time to start winding down for us now, much like these impalas. Some are starting to lie down. It's nice and cool. It's a great time to soak in the day and be grateful for the day that we've had. some beautiful sounds tonight we had some amazing birds today and it wouldn't have been the same without you so thank you so much for joining us for another wonderful sunset safari live in the bush we look forward to having you with us again in the morning 5 30 a.m central african time bring your a game it's tawny tuesday tomorrow it's going to be amazing bring the cat energy and hopefully we'll be able to find some of those predators that gave us in juma the slip today at least <laughs> but we will be looking forward to seeing what the sunrise safari has in store for us have a good day or not wherever you are and thank you again for coming with us for another epic safari bye everybody Viewer discretion is advised.